Uh, those that are still waiting to sign in will have time during our break to sign in as well. Excuse me. Excuse me, I'm speaking. Thank you. You're still waiting to sign in. All right, we're going to start off first with my hand. Excuse me. Excuse me, I'm speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to move down to welcome us yet. Uh, welcome everybody that's come out tonight, especially uh, those that this might be your first meeting, and especially those that are parents of students in our district. Welcome. I now look for a motion to approve our first meeting. I'd like to say uh, we have two items of great interest to the public. On this agenda, they are item 13 and 19. I think to better serve the public, and we have two items. I'd like to move that we hear agenda item 19 immediately. Yeah, they are items for agenda items as well. And 19. Thank you. 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 All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. I'm sorry, four members and said aye. So we have a motion to have a for the discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. I said aye. I'm trying to get a look all those. Sorry, against that motion, say aye. 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 So I'm trying to get more all of them. Again, that person is going to be a person. I'm 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 going to be a person. Of the minutes. 
Uh, I understand that, but I feel this is an important part. Someone picked out what they felt was the important part and left this out. I feel that was important. Sure. Yeah, that would have to be done by motion. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I motion that we hold on. Mr. Anderson's first is also had a comment. I just want to say that I never used the word ashamed. Uh, you have to put that in there. I felt like my granddaughter didn't like the change, but not, I just felt that was a poor choice of words to describe what I was. So I just wanted to put, just describe that word. First, a motion by Peter Senate and second by Ms. Wine to approve the minute with Ms. Parson change. Any further discussion on that? Well, I'd like to make a motion that we amend the minutes. We have a motion on the table and a second. So we're going to vote on that first. Any further discussion on the motion that has been made? Seeing none. All those in favor of that motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any opposed? I said aye. Okay. So that's seven to zero. I'd like to make a motion that we amend the minutes as I stated. I have a copy of it here to submit. With the minutes have already been approved, the correct process would be uh, I would like to make a motion and he says that they had an existing motion on the table. Right. After there was a first and a second on that motion, correct? I didn't hear a motion to amend. There was, yeah, no motion to amend. All right, so that's done. Moving down to board number report, Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since the last board meeting, I and other trustees have received hundreds of emails in opposition to the proposal of eliminating public comment during individual action items at the time they are being discussed. I responded to as many of those as I could, the submitted emails and let them know that I voted in opposition to this proposal. I stand with those that have voiced their opposition and I am a public servant who supports the right of the people to speak. Parents have the ultimate authority over decisions that involve their children and must be heard. Sure. Yeah. Tonight we will review the superintendent's evaluation. I will speak of a steady decline in our district's test scores during the current superintendent's tenure. Also, I will point out financial faults that have been found in audit reports for at least the last three years that have cost the district fines of over $350,000 plus grant reimbursements that could have been set much higher. Finally, I would speak to a lack of leadership in addressing safety issues in our schools and thank our Lyon County Sheriff for stepping up to fill that void. Do you want me to um, what read my having to grant or what? Uh, this is uh, Ron Fort Member Report. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Well, there's the middle school graduation that we all attended, and um, for what's been going on in Burnley was our literally our girls just took first place in the state and they gave them little bats to encourage your kids 
they gave them a room that looked like a Super Bowl room that was huge, and they gave them the tattoos that said regional and state champions. And then um, for basketball for the summer, uh, they went to Bend, Utah, the Burnley Gems. And uh, anyway, they went to Bend against 216 teams. They come in first place. So our team is going to be quite the team next year, I think. Let's see. Um, I guess that's about it. I'll All right, Mr. Uh, McIntyre. I just want to report. Um, this is my first year. We have only been here on the board for a couple months, but I did get the pleasure to attend four graduations. Um, two of those being eighth grade promotions out of Silverland. I mean, how big that school was that they had to hold it in two different sessions to promote all the eighth graders. Uh, and then the last one that I attended was the adult education graduation, which was a very special graduation. Um, I see the look in those eyes of all ages, 18, all the way up to I think like seven years old, and see those people step going and graduating in, in the work that the district puts in to uh, lead those people to get their diplomas. And I thought it was a very special occasion, and I was glad to be there. Thank you. Ms. Pierre. Yeah, I do enjoy graduation. Um, really a fun time to go um, celebrate with the kids. And I also have an opportunity to stop by the Econ Summit and uh, see a bunch of the presentations that the kids have put together about the different countries they learn about. Um, that's always a really fun event. And I was uh, glad to be able to attend that. And that's all we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I attended two graduations as well. These are my favorites. These are the kids' pieces, the recognizing pieces, and you see the growth in them. Um, this is basically the culmination of what you work for. Um, our goal is every child graduates college and career ready and be honest for that. It's really cool, and I love doing that. Um, I also attended two community events in Mesa Valley. They were well attended and quite lovely. I really, really appreciate these events, especially the community I hope to see programs again. Um, a special shout out to Omar and the chamber for a fantastic burger and a great time. Um, and then just one more thing, I just want to uh, say as we cut out to travel and celebrate the 4th of July, as we get a lot of people are leaving, just to first say thank you to all of our veterans. My grandfather um, served in the top of the community, and my father in law, unfortunately, we can't see him, but he served three, four, three, get um, um, in the Navy. And, I just am deeply grateful for that service and for the service you occupied for all of the brave men and women that wanted to know if that was a great gift. And um, of course, it's like me up. And then just welcome to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark. Uh, I just want to say thank you for this one. So, I also attended several graduation promotion exercises while we were doing here. We were pretty amazing. Uh, I'm impressed. That you, uh, the effort that some of these kids have put in with doing, you know, getting their bachelor's or excuse me, all that their degrees, associate degrees, thank you. Um, by the time we graduated, there was quite a few of them that can impress with them. So that's what I meant to do. And then I'd like to further add some comments. So this time to write these down. In the past few weeks, I, along with some of my fellow board members, have received numerous emails, correspondence, phone calls regarding the proposed changes to board policy. <clears throat> and emails expressed concern and even an outrage over the police that we as a board were attempting to sound the public or worse violate people's First Amendment rights directly. I completely understand the emotional response that was caused by that allegation. Many emails were written such a way as to establish bona fides for the author's credentials as an American citizen, taxpayer, parent, voter, etc. The beauty of this great nation we live in is that every American is a stakeholder in this process, and each viewpoint is equal and important, so establish your credentials is fine but unnecessary. Some of you even went further to identify yourself as a veteran while well, insinuating that I go against what you fought for, namely the constitutional freedoms we have. Furthermore, several of you compared me and others to the Nazi Party, communists, or just completely disloyal Americans. I'd like to respond to those items. First and foremost, the allegations of the board trying to silence anyone or make people shut up should not be further from the truth. 
that with prominent members of the community have helped to spread that misinformation. Oh, the politics of audacity, the sad and reality in our country. The more outrageous and audacious the lie is, the more people will say that's got to be true because why would someone in a position like that make something like that up? Fortunately, as our second president, John Adams, once eloquently said, facts are stuck the same. And what may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts or evidence. Let's get right to the facts at hand. The open meeting laws of state and Nevada are very clear, concise, and completely necessary. They apply to this board and we are legally compelled to adhere to them. Chapter 241 of the Nevada Variety Statute contains all the necessary rules we must follow. NRS 241.020 goes into great detail about the rules that must be followed when conducting these meetings. Everything contained in the new proposed BDD policy is completely in compliance with the open meeting law of the state of Nevada. In fact, the option on how to format and conduct the public comment portion of these meetings has been alleged to be silenced in the public before. I think the most recent case is involved in other school boards in the state. The Office of the Attorney General filed number 13897-430, dated January 31st of this year, in which the same allegation was made against the Clark County School Board and School Trustees. <clears throat> Here, the board afforded two periods of public comment. During the August 26 meeting, the first period was devoted to items that on the board's agenda. It's important for the first alternative for public comment under NRS 241.020. In addition, the board agenda is item 0.801 for public comment on items within the board's jurisdiction, but not specifically listed on the board's agenda. This complies with the OML requirements of the OML. Public body allowed time for general public comments prior to adjournment under NRS 241.020. Accordingly, the Office of the Attorney General found no violation. The simple fact is not only does the new policy follow the law precisely, it also actually affords even more opportunity for public participation in the form of electronic communication during the meeting. Communications that are one, not bound by time or size, and two, are not bound by the schedule of the meeting. Based on the number of emails I received in the last month, it is obvious that we live in an age where that technological opportunity exists for almost everyone wanting to participate in these meetings. Recently, there were some social media posts going around saying, and I quote, Lyon County School Board wants you to shut up. That was slick, effective, attention you get into that. Factual, honest, not even close. It bears repeating, facts are stubborn things. What I found most concerning about this particular social media post is that it was shared by a public official. Assemblyman Tim Gray shared it to at least three close friends of mine via social media. It was then forwarded to me. They contacted me directly and shared the post. Obviously, they were alarmed. But they did reach out to discuss. I'm glad they did. I was able to explain the facts I just laid out. One of my friends further explained some facts to me, considering the source that I'd like to share, just that we're all on the same page. Fact, a recent assembly bill was passed and signed by the government. Then we built 219 addresses and revisions to the Nevada Open Meeting Law, specifically in regard to the public comment section of the law. It actually reaffirms the options clause of when and where public comments must be included, the ones we are absolutely compliant with. <clears throat> Just an FYI, it passed unanimously that the movement is getting gray included. So, my question is this if Assemblyman Gray is fully aware that you're compliant with the law that he voted for, did he mischaracterize, exaggerate, or perpetuate something that was untrue? Or did you feel the law itself was unfair and allowed for the sound to ensue? That's kind of confusing. Another fact I learned recently, a governing body here in Lyon County was alleged to and then found to have been in violation of open meeting laws of the state, specifically in regards to public comment and participation. That governing body is the Lyon County Board of Commissioners. These violations occurred in 2021, and I quote the Office of Attorney General for the State of Nevada's findings of fact and conclusions of law in case number 13897-420. The Lyon County Commissioner's action resulted in the public being uninformed of such board deliberation and unable to provide comment prior to the board instructing staff to take positions on legislation. That is silencing the people with legal facts to back it up. I'm sure most of you are aware the school was Lyon County Commissioner in 2021. Those stubborn facts. I'd like to close with responding to the suggestions and insinuations of my character and my patriotism I received in the correspondence. I, too, am a tax paying citizen of Lyon County. I, too, am a registered voter and I vote in every election. I'm also a parent of two children in the school district and I'm married to an educator. Furthermore, I, too, serve my country with honor and I'm a combat veteran of the United States Marine Corps. 
a matter of fact, I was injured while in combat to the point that I now have physical limitations I will live with for the rest of my life. I don't regret a single minute of that time. My point is this, I have a lot in common with each of you, and when it comes to patriotism or loyalty to this country, I'm glad to compare my credentials to Ann to anyone in this room. Thank you. Uh, so I really want to just focus my comments on the great uh, things that are happening in our district and to say it's a lot this last month has uh, has been amazing. Um some of the things that I've been able to attend and do. I was first uh, was able to attend the Winrich uh, graduation ceremony with Ms. Peterson and uh, they had one graduate this time, so that was really great. Again, I think that those graduates um, appreciate that opportunity to graduate more than I think a lot of our other uh, seniors in our high school. Later that day, I was able to come over to uh, Silver State High School and attend the International Economic Summit. Again, what a great event that our staff was able to put on. Um, each school sends teams that compete on a bunch of different um, competitions representing our country. They make sandwich boards, bring food, uh, dress in the costume of that country. Um, throughout the event, you have the big champions, that's high income countries, that's middle income countries, that's low income countries, that's in representation, and the culminating event of being summit champion. I was able to attend the DIS promotion, and then the next day, um, the DHS graduation ceremony. Um, the graduation ceremony was not only special because I had the opportunity to get my oldest son his diploma, but I was also able to hand diplomas to so many of his friends. A few of those friends, I don't think they ever saw themselves crossing that stage, but persevered and made it. Who made that possible? Great parents, great teachers, great counselors, great coaches, and other mentors along the way. The next night, I was able to attend a graduation ceremony in Smith Valley. Smith Valley always does a good job recognizing their graduates and promoters. As I was leaving with Mr. Logan, somebody ran out the doors and said, Mr. Cooey, is it your dad, the one that taught at, um, at Yarrington High School? I, I told her that that was my uh, grandfather, and she told me what a great teacher he was. And he was hard but always fair. Um, when I ran into the school district, I ran into many people that had him as a teacher. The ironic thing is that I never met him because he passed away the year after I was born, but his influence is still being felt in our community today. We can all point to that one teacher that has a great influence on our life. Our district is so blessed. Have so many of those teachers within our ranks. After graduation season, I've been very involved with many of our students in our schools as they competed at the district level of Little League Baseball. I was able to attend a major tournament at Nelco as my young son um, competed on his team. This was going to be one of the first all star tournaments that I could spectate, not a coach. I was actually really looking forward to it. Um, as the tournament approached, they had one game where they needed an umpire, and I volunteered. It was the first time in several weeks that I could shut the outside world out and concentrate on what was happening on the field. It was an amazing game between Ruby Mountain Little League from Spring Creek and High Desert Little League from Burnley. The game was an elimination game, so one team was ending their tournament on the field. Burnley ended up prevailing in the bottom of the six with a walk-off hit into the gap. Scoring the runner from second base. One notable player from Burnley was <clears throat> LP Martinez, who caught the first three innings and won the Golden Glove Award from the district. He's a great kid. He's also the son of two school district employees, Mr. Alfredo Martinez and Ms. Pamela Martinez. And for that, they must be proud. As I was on time in the game, it really put into perspective what we were dealing with here today. 
May we have LCSC students out on the field working hard to play the game and having great teachers and active parents in the dugout that have worked with these kids four years to get them ready for the big game. The job of the umpire is a neutral party to make sure that all the kids are playing by the same rules and calling a fair game. An umpire's job is not to change calls, but call it one way or the other based on what side is allowed. During the game, I had a pick from Ruby Mountain who was getting frustrated first with his teammate and then with me and the strike zone. The district administrator and host will wait present believe that it should have been ejected from the game. As a coach, I can sense the player's frustration and a high pressure situation that he was under. I was thinking, what would have happened if he was ejected from the game? Would it make the situation better or worse? I would have had one side happy and the other unhappy. Again, as a neutral arbiter, I want to see the results of the game being in the player's hands. I want to see as a board member the decisions being made between parents and teachers and blocking out the special interest in a child's education. The guy yelling from center field has no bearing on the decision by many kids on fire. This past weekend, I was confirming coaching a team of seniors that took second place to qualify for the state tournament this weekend. I'm absolutely blessed to have the experience that I've been able to have with them. Some of the kids on this team I've coached in T ball. Being a part of their lives has been an amazing experience. With that, I would also, so I'm going to end those comments, and I just want to talk about something that happened at the last board meeting and, um, and some accusations that were made uh, regarding textbooks and how this board didn't have a sign for approving the textbook. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody has a real clear understanding of. NRS 389 840. Um, and I'm not going to read this entirely, but I think that it's important to point out certain points in here that final selection by the state board um, shall make the final selection of all textbooks to be used in the public schools in the state. If a textbook proposed for selection is in a subject area for which standards of contents have been established by the council to establish extra standards for public schools. The state board shall not select the textbook unless the state board determines that the textbook adequately supports the standards of that subject area. Um, you know, there's also there's been claims made as far as you know, teachers can teach whatever uh, they want or not want. Um, for me personally, I think we have great teachers in this district. I think that they teach everything the way that they should. They all have a rubric for. Um, when they're reviewing that, our board resolution, um, the, and it's a, right on our website under the Board of Trustees, it's a resolution of the Board of Trustees of Lyon County School District affirming their commitment to equitable educational opportunities for all students. Um, number three, though, I think needs to be reiterated because I heard one of our trustees uh, basically giving bad advice, and so I just want to make sure that that's dispelled. Any school officer or teacher who violates the provisions of NRS 389.840, 239.880, inclusive or knowingly fails to follow the regulations of the state board relating to use of textbooks shall be punished by a fine of not more than 250. So I want to make sure you know that everybody knows on the record that you know there are penalties associated with not following the textbooks that um that's that not more than 250, 250 per person. So, what would the total cost be to change our curriculum and get something that's better suited for our county? Yeah, you know, my board member report, Mr. Hendricks. Again, I mean, there's a process laid out by the state. It's in NRS 389.840. So, I mean, those are the those are the materials that we're able to approve as board. But were we required to do them at that point in time? No. Yeah, it's off topic. That concludes our board member report. I will move on to attitude of gratitude, Mr. Hendricks. My attitude of gratitude is from Roman. He said that I am successful at Sutro Elementary School because Mrs. Reed is helping me with strategies and reading, math, and writing. 
Also, she helped me learn what to do whenever I get angry. Another thing I am thankful for is her help with social studies and book reports. My name is Layla, and I am successful at the Dover Stage Middle School because of Ms. Becca. I want to thank Ms. Becca. She is the best teacher I have ever had. She helps me a lot with my work and yeah. helps me understand stuff. Right. Yeah, my attitude and gratitude. Uh, my name is. Kalia Price, and I am successful at Silver State Middle School because of Mr. Wiley. I want to thank him for always helping me learn in many ways, such as helping me grow my math ability, always making me proud when I grow in math and identity. So my attitude graduate is from Lexi Gray. She says that she is successful at Smith Valley. Because of Ms. Kuzia. I want to thank her for always being there when I need help. Also, if I'm struggling, she always stops what she's doing and comes and helps me. If I get a question wrong, she will go over it again in the class. I love being in her class because she is really funny and it's always exciting to go in her class. Uh, my name is Diego Villalobos. I'm from successful at Dayton High School because of Mr. Corbett. I want to thank him for being the awesome coach and mentor. I appreciate you for sharing, showing me how to be a great mentor. My name is Devanaya Winter, and I am successful at my own because of Mr. Knox. I want to thank him for helping me get better at math. He is a fun teacher and super nice too. I like the math song we played before some of the lessons. I said, my name is Haley Kruger, and I'm successful at Dayton High School because of Mrs. Carolyn Conserve. I want to thank her for making sure I get my work done for my classes, keeping me in check, and providing a great environment for students and staff. Thank you. And my name is from Michaela Frazier, who is successful at Harrington Intermediate School because of Mr. Nicholas. I want to thank him for being an amazing teacher and always being there for his students. Mr. Nicholas has helped me to learn so much this year. I am very thankful that he is a teacher here at YIS. His class is very fun, just like his archery enrichment. I think it is my favorite enrichment so far. Mr. Nicholas is a very kind and a great teacher. All right, moving down to the superintendent report. Thank you, Mr. President. So I, uh, tonight, want to follow the lead of our students and express my gratitude. And so I've prepared some uh, words of gratitude here. Uh, first of all, I want to express my gratitude to our Silver Stage staff and Nutrition Services for hosting us here tonight and uh, putting things uh, together for us. I am also very grateful for all the graduations and promotions that we were able to attend and, and see the successes of our students. It's always a great pleasure to see them reach their goals and, and cross that stage. But I'm also very grateful for our summer school educators. And when I use the term educators, as you well know, I'm talking about all of our staff because I believe our staff from our the second our students see our bus drivers to uh, the, the time they're with their teachers, their uh, lunch professionals, secretaries, custodians, they are all educators and have an impact on our, our students' lives. And so I want to thank all of our summer school educators who have worked so diligently with our students this month, getting them to school, feeding them, teaching them, and making sure they have everything they need to meet their individual goals. I'm also very grateful for all of our educators who work tirelessly for our children in Lyon County School District. These are some of the most incredible people in the world who dedicate their time and talents to our youth. They live in our community, attend our churches, perform volunteer work, coach our youth teams and perform other civic duties. They are incredible role models for our children and I'm grateful for the example they set not only for my own children, but for all of our children. These educators positively impact the lives of our children every single day in our community. 
I'm also so very grateful to work and serve in such an incredible organization like the Lyon County School District, where we honor and love our service men and women, our first responders, our veterans, and other community heroes to do so much for our great country, state, and community. Our school's old assembly is another service, other services to honor all of our heroes and to teach our children their civic duty. Additionally, I'm so very grateful to work and serve in the Lyon County School District where we stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance every single day to remind us of the blessing we have to live in this free country, that this is one nation under God, as we just stated in the Pledge of Allegiance. This is always followed by a moment of silence so that individual educators and students can commune with their God every day as they wish and choose. What other employer in Lyons County can say this? What other employer in Lyons County provides so many service opportunities for their employees and stakeholders as does the Lyons County School District? So thank you. Thank you to our educators. Thank you to our students. Thank you to our families. And thank you to our community members for making the Lyons County School District such an incredible place to work and exemplify the values of the community, state, and country that we live in. A wise person once taught me that conflict is inevitable. But contention is a choice, and we all know who the author of contention is. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Workman. All right, moving down to public participation. So I'd just like to remind the public that this is for any item that's not on the agenda. So at this point, I have to read the statement. Public is invited to address the board on items not listed on the agenda. The purpose of public comment is to bring issues, concerns, or praiseworthy items to the agenda of the board. No action may be taken on any subject raised during public comment until the matter has been properly placed on its agenda for a properly noted meeting pursuant to NRS 41. If you wish to speak, please step up to the front table, be seated, and state your name. Your comments must be limited to no more than three minutes unless all on your subject. Within the board's jurisdiction and control, questions should be submitted to the board clerk in writing. In consideration of others, avoid repetition. Although this board does not restrict comments based upon viewpoint, comments will be prohibited if the content are willfully disrupted by NRS not personal attack or interfere with the rights of other speakers. Comments made during this time will be monitored by the board president. Brent Clawson, President Cooey, Superintendent Workman, kind of sort of like the majority plan to tell my county citizens to shut up tonight. The previous board decided my county citizens are no longer allowed to hold consent agenda items for further discussion. The consent agenda item being travel is curious. Why so rigid? First, on page 80, the travel request to the world class construction of design and assessment leader conference states that it was submitted the needed four weeks prior to the board meeting. It was submitted June 7th, not June 30th. So, who checked the yes, which was travel request was submitted four weeks prior to the meeting? And who will attend these conferences? For example, why no names for the two Yale options? Again, this suggests that this administration and board majority supports a lack of transparency and accountability. Next, if Lyon County taxpayers pay for these trips, should we not learn what Lyon County for the trip travel is funded? Why do we not have travelers submit trip reports upon the return for the taxpayers and board members to review? Finally, along these lines, who reviews the content for this video conference? Listen to how this conference voted to provide its topic. Quote, you can expect conference sessions on these topics. Warning, expect pure awesomeness out of this year's session. Unquote. Now, just one session example. Quote, equity and social justice, end quote. Next, to use the language of conference planners, quote, you all want to miss the spotlight sessions, end quote. Again, another example, quote, working toward critical consciousness to center racialized bilingual students in our schools, classrooms, and communities, end quote. Questions for Superintendent Workman, as well as then President Lyons, and then for now President Cooney, who are all signatories to certain board resolutions. First, do you, do you know what, for example, critical consciousness to center racialized by the student need? Or to make it simpler, do you know what a racialized by the student is? And if you do, how do these sessions comply with the Lyon County School District Board resolution to ensure, quote, educational opportunities for all students? Just as an aside, today is not even a minority whatsoever. Do you know that self checkers change racialized to radicalized? Perhaps we should heed that warning. All humans are created from the same origin and purpose, the love and beneficence of an all good God. Each soul shares the unity of what we are, who we are, and whom we are. 
It is only fit of this world in circumstances of a world to provide us. I urge this board to reject this proper request and I urge this board to stop funding the racialization of Lyons County Schools. Thank you. I'd like to make a comment to that real quick. So, um, Mr. Lawson made a reference that this is paid for by Lane County taxpayers. Um, it is not, I mean, I'm looking at it right now. Fund 280 is a grant, um, it's paid for by a grant. So, it's usually part of the requirement of getting that grant is that so much of that money be paid for, uh, for education. My name is Michelle Austin, and I am a non-person, non-resident, unenfranchised natural woman, and I am standing on my common law rights. I am sure the public and mom and dad that have kids that attend Lyon County schools already have this trust issue. And if you take away the physical school board meetings for public comments, that it will continue to erode any trust that might still be left. People tend to make these moves when they really have things to hide from the public. If the schools were not propagandizing to the students, if they were not sexualizing them, if they were not making them political activists, teaching them to hate the color they were born with, teaching them to hate America, creating multiple types of division among them, why would you need to stop physical public board meetings? This move you are proposing is nothing more than covering yourself with a gigantic fig leaf because you would be hiding from the from the public and you do not want to face the criticism and critical thinking comments from the public meetings. You don't want me to ask the community or against the agenda that schools are forcing upon the kids and you are forcing this agenda because of the federal funding that you receive. Daily caller headline reads Biden administration sent 44 billion to states who implemented CRT in schools. Nevada was one of the states that received those funds. The devil is in detail. You say you can read comments online and still participate. That is true. However, the reality is that you will be able to ignore all the comments and not read one, therefore setting the public opinion down. You are supposed to represent these people, not use your elected elected platform to gain power, project power, or move your personal beliefs and agenda forward. But yet here we are, and like the last meeting I attended where the people didn't want the new school book for the communist fist and the rainbow colors representing LGBT plus, which means pedophile, only two of you voted against the book, but the rest of you forced to heaven and went against the people. The right, that right there proves what I just stated. If I had kids in school, I'd be taking them out and homeschooling them. The best way to trump evil is to stop participating. Mom and dad should band together and start their own homeschooling because our school systems have been infiltrated and taken over. We all have to see the Bud Light effect of not participating. Schools might want to heed that warning. Parents, I ask you, how much do your kids mean to you? Is it worth destroying their innocence, rewiring their little brains to values and morals that don't align with yours? We all have choices in life. It's just a matter of what choice you make. Policies, mandates, statutes are null and void if they oppose the Constitution or Bill of Rights, and you took your oath to the Constitution. Your oath to the Constitution trumps any other oath you may have taken. You can see by the showing that we, the people, that we are not in favor of taking away public in person funds. <laughs> James Whistler. There's a quick question about the social studies coming out. When is that supposed to take effect? This year coming up or 2025? Superintendent? This coming school year. Okay, so we have one week, May 10th. The email goes out about parents being able to go to year and attend this. View what is in those books. One week, the month before school lets out. Pathetic in all absolute form. This should have been to us in January, given us two to three plus months. This curriculum was only in your intent. It was not pushed out to the rest of the high schools or main office that the parents could get to. No one has the time to travel up to two hours to view this in the given time during most of the working day. So I am sorry, but you felt at your job notifying the parents about this. You felt at your job getting it out so we had time to look at it and evaluate. You guys pushed it so fast that it's almost suspect on why. You guys need to come up with an alternative or ask the state if there are alternatives for the parents that do not want their children learning 
this side. Push the button. Oh, Sean. How's that? There. My name is Sean Newman and I live in Burma. I am a citizen and I too vote. And while I will respect your service, it has no business here. So I'm here to talk about what Tom alerted me to. And uh, I have to agree with him. You should either listen to every parent in this room, or you should resign, or we should recall you, or vote you out at the next opportunity. Set up policies for local schools in alignment with what the parents of that county who elected them wishes are. And monitor fiscal responsibilities and incorporate the parents' visions of what students, of what the students know and can achieve. Their main function is to ensure the best possible possible education for all students. They are to analyze, they being you, uh, the curricula and decide how money is spent or best raised. And uh, in a rare case, by something like CRP in the school system. Um, it is up to uh, them via the wishes of the citizens here uh, that put them in office, they voted them in office to find ways to best teach our kids how to read and write and do arithmetic, history, and sciences. Uh, I can tell you my son graduated three years ago. And he writes chicken scratch like he's in kindergarten. Y'all should be ashamed. <laughs> Every one of you. Yes. Um, it should not be taken away. Citizens' voices and feelings make your job more efficient. This is not about your job. This is about taking care of our children. Uh, why, why do you ask to be our representatives if you don't care to listen to us? Um, you don't care about our opinion for our children's education, then you should resign. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I'd like to say another reminder that we will have plenty of opportunities to speak on that item when it comes on our agenda that is for public participation for items that are not on the agenda. Um, I think so. Talking about gratitude, I'm grateful. <laughs> My name is Barry Ann Pichak, and I am a, um, a, a citizen of Lyon County. I live in Stagecoach. Um, we've been in, in Nevada for the last 12 years. Prior to that, um, I was a uh, administrative assistant for the superintendent of Rusty Union School District for 11 years. I served with three different superintendents and um, several different boards. And I, uh, I'm um, disappointed in what I have seen from this board as I've come to meetings with the lack of taking care of business and with the emphasis on personal um, and political positions. But understanding that, that most of you are uh, registered as Republicans, um, and I don't think, I think that that should probably change because you are not supporting 
the values and the um, the values and the family feeling that that represent that being a Republican say you represent and I don't see that um, and a couple of comments that I I have based on um, the uh, remarks that different people have made um, Mr. Cody Cody um, it's absolutely um, admirable and, and understandable how proud you are of your grandfather um, and to know that he had such a, a long lasting impression uh, made on kids. Um, I would I would say, however, that if we compare to the curriculum that he taught and the feelings that went on in those days, in the very same classroom that he probably taught in, compared to now, it would be vastly different. Also, um, you made a comment about you don't, as a coach, or rather as an, an official, you don't, uh, are not influenced by the center field. And uh, I took that to mean that you will, your vote will not be based on what the public opinion is. And I think that that is wrong because as an official, you're there to do a specific thing. As a, as a board member, you're here to represent, because you have been voted in to represent this county and to say that you're not going to listen to us when you make a decision, I think is very, very disappointing. Good evening. My name is Deanne Davis and I'll continue with the attitude of gratitude. I'm thankful for all the people who have come out tonight to participate in this school board meeting. I thank you for the opportunity to speak and that you're really truly listening. And I'm thankful that I was alerted in this past month to what's going on at these school board meetings and in Lyons County. I'm new to this county, but I've been a teacher for over 30 years in public school. And I was hoping that this county was different than where I came from. Unfortunately, my eyes have been open to see that it's not. And while some of us are here for a particular issue, I want to alert all of you to the idea that our eyes have now been opened and you are under scrutiny like a microscope. Yes, sure. I'm one of those who wrote a letter to each of the trustees who I would ask you to please be trustworthy. And I did receive some advice back, one of them from Ms. Villains, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, who asked me if I had been able to read the draft item that I was concerned about. And I responded to her that no, I was not able to read the draft item, even though I'm familiar with websites. I had gone to the website where it was supposed to be posted several weeks after the main meeting, and it was still not available. I continue to look for it. I did ask for another trustee who gave me a link to it, which I appreciate. And I, I looked through it with scrutiny, and I was horrified by other things I discovered. One of the things that was voted on was that my county is going to offer counseling through an outside um, department without any parent knowledge or consent. And the trustees debated about whether this would make it easier for kids to access things that parents would disapprove of. And even though they admitted that it would make it more difficult, or that it would make it easier for students to access this, they went ahead and voted seven to zero, which I was disappointed with in favor of it. Um, that now students can receive counseling for any type of medical or emotional or gender issues that they want through the school. Another thing I noticed in the meeting minutes was SEL, which is code word for social emotional learning. As a teacher myself for 30 years, I know that's code word for CRT, indoctrination, 
pedophilia. It's a free period where teachers can speak out and teach whatever they please under the code of SEL. Teachers can do uh, meditation, Eastern religion. They can do uh, acting out scenes, how to deceive your parents, anything that counts as SEL. Also, the social studies DPQ. I heard you about a teacher of that. That's another one. We're going to scrutinize. Uh, you will put yourself in scrutiny. <laughs> If I can, perhaps there's been some misinformation. The state sends to us what the curriculum is. We don't have an ability. You guys not realize those decisions are made at the state level. We here in Lyon County are very differently comprised than in Clark County. I'm sure we all agree. They send it to us. Mr. Biden, could we pick up, just pick something other than what they've approved? Um, not without scrutinization by uh, the Attorney General's office. Um, okay. And the SDL, I agree. The SDL comment, I agree with you, ma'am. But a Senate bill, or perhaps a Senate bill, Senate bill, has required us to do that. We were required to put that into policy. I think a lot of the momentum here tonight needs to be focused at the state level. That's where these changes are being made. I agree with you. Thank you. What change? Go ahead. My name is Doug Clemens. Your mic's not on, Doug. Uh, my name is Doug Clemens. I live in Dayton. Uh, I'm a Marine Corps vet, currently combat wounded. Uh, served in Afghanistan two times to Iraq and once in Syria. And then I <laughs> my current issue that I'm having with this is uh, sorry, just uh, the counseling session of what, what we're having with parents that are being moved from having their say uh, with their kids in schools. That, like Lady Jeanette had just said, that we're outsourcing counseling to uh, a third party, uh, third party counseling service for these student apps for these kids that are having these emotional, medical, or other problems that the parents are not addressing or is being addressed here in school is very deeply concerning. And now, with the issue that we're popping up with, is that the school and the school board is trying to remove parents as a whole from having. Uh, having their opinion in non-agenda related items that includes includes this too. <clears throat> what it you know, what it seems like is that even with the parents coming in here to vote, and that most of these agendas are actually going through that are already pre-voted. It's, it's already seemed like that. Well, the last meeting that was already uh, already stated, the agenda that was posted, there was already several uh, several votes that were on there that were already set to zero, which looked like that these votes were outside of the school board. And not with us being here. Most of the parents here, they're coming here specifically for this. They're seeing that, they're seeing this, they're reading your guys' agenda here. And it's it's very concerning. Even then for me, I have two and I actually have three nieces that I'm taking full custody here in the next month. Both of them are coming from all three of them are coming from an abuse home where their father is currently in jail, their mother is a drug addict right now. And we're taking full uh, full custody of them. They're going to be at. They're going to uh, mental counseling all three of them. But if this counseling that the county is trying to outsource to that to a third party, if if my nieces were to come in and talk to the counselor, and the counselor is not basically required to let that, to let me know what they're talking about and just sending them off to counseling, that is very concerning for most of us. Thank you. So first, I just wanted to thank you uh, for your service, and I think that there was an accusation made there that we don't listen to parents, which I think is totally untrue. Um, when I gave the analogy of being the umpire, and there's parents and teachers in the dugout and the students on the field, I see the parents and teachers uh, being very active in their child's education. What I'm talking about is that guy that's out center field that has absolutely 
you know, he's out there for a good time or whatever and is yelling that, yeah, that ball's too high or that ball's too low or, you know, it, basically, I mean, they have nothing to do with what's happening on the field. They're just out there, um, yeah, just someone just scored and, you know, have a problem with what's going on in the game, trying to cause, you know, fractures and fissures where they don't need to be, so. Are you talking as Cameron or as Shockley? Do you have anything else to say? Or did you want me to clarify the counseling service yet that we're voted on yeah. from Sheriff Smola? Let's clarify that. So just, just to clarify the misinformation, um, the state law already allows students to access counseling services in Nevada without their information. That has nothing to do with the Lyon County School District. The Lyon County School District simply acquired a third party service that will allow uh, parents and students who choose to participate in this to access mental health services by providers in Nevada. It is not providers at the school, they are providers certified in Nevada. So I, I apologize if there's misinformation out there. I thought we cleared it up in the last meeting, but we're happy to provide more information on that if needed. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Cecilia Gary. Um, I would like to go over a few things this board has done in the past few years and recently. Way back in September of 2021, several citizens and I asked this board to look at their policy AP because some of some items that were proposed, equity, diversity, and inclusion, basically CRT. The board was willing to look at and take these policies to take out some bias CRT language. With the cooperation of Mr. Cowley, who at that time stood up for the, these changes, they did listen to the citizens. They were also willing to develop a resolution, which you quote often, that would prohibit the teaching of any type of discrimination. But not three months later, in December of 2021, this board decided to give Mr. Workman a 33% pay rate. This was this the price of getting this resolution passed. I have asked this board what specific actions of Mr. Workman deserve this rate. No good answer has been provided. Why? I have also asked this board what actions they take to monitor road teachers from teaching these marketing materials, now having them adopted into the curriculum from the last school board meeting, to basically give them the green light to do so. They did not listen to the citizens that overwhelmingly opposed it. Why? What is your motivation? Department of Education is forcing you to do this? That's just the line of the thing. Another item that, that has been voted in by this board in the May meeting was to give students access to unsupervised counseling. This means they can talk to a counselor without direct knowledge or monitoring. These days, many in the counseling profession are pushing kids to go transgender or homosexual if they are having emotional issues. Very dangerous for our kids. This board also adopted SDL, which was mentioned before. Social emotional learning in the last meeting. This is right out of the Marxist Socialist Handbook, the handbook of basically CRT. The Department of Education is pushing all of this indoctrination onto our kids, and you are going along with it. That's not going to be forced to. So much for the Lyon County School District saying it does not teach CRT. This district is like many others. They will do anything for the almighty dollar for the Department of Ed instead of doing the right thing. You are not looking out for our kids. You are looking out for your bottom line, period. Thank you. So since you mentioned the board resolution, I'll bring it up again. It's on the district uh, website under the chart view page. Um, I find it interesting that Douglas County has recently adopted our same resolution. Um, and I, you know, conversations with their board president as well. So they adopted the same thing. Do you guys think that CRT is being taught in our district? Please bring us examples. I, I ask that every time. Please bring us examples. Bring them forward. You know, I get, I, I've had calls uh, saying that, you know, bus drivers are asking kids for pronouns and this and that. And it's like, if, if there's examples of that, please bring it forward because we would love to address it. Yes, sir. Go ahead. 
I'd also like to bring up too with the example of SEL user run. What would happen if we were to comply with the law? You're talking about Specifically with that SEO example, there's a multiple input system that requires that we adopt new policy and in the curriculum and SEO. And they, of course, gave us one. Uh, all cool business in the state of Nevada are subject to the uh, State Board of Education and their guidelines. And the State Board of Education is represented by the Attorney General's Office. Uh, the State Board has a wide variety of things that they can do um, that range from uh, not funding particular things. Uh, even uh, several years ago in White Pine, they took over the school district and took over all financial responsibility of the district and um, removed it from the local boards and took it statewide. Where's the financial reasons? Well, that wasn't for yeah. That was for financial. Yeah, I, I, and, and that is true. I'm just talking about the scope of uh, what the state can do if there is uh, non-compliance. Uh, we also read that uh, board members can be uh, personally responsible financially if there are certain things that are not compliant. So there's a wide variety of, of things that the uh, state board of education can do in connection to the students as well. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Michelle Matheson. You are asking to see when, according to the Nevada Association of School Boards, you do not teach CRT, you teach SEL. But also in your document here, it also says that the board, as I quote, number one, acts as a liaison between the schools and the community. Number two, maintains awareness of community attitudes, values, and interests. Number three, actively participates in programs that build good community relationships. Number eight, support district schools of meaningful, engaged families. Number 10, encourages the community to follow appropriate accounts to express their ideas and concerns for the district via the superintendent. And the superintendent is to be working with parents and other groups and other organizations. It also it offers the board superintendent the opportunities to learn how the district can and does engage in the family. Also, it says here on improving both uh, student outcomes. School systems exist to improve student outcomes. That's it and nothing else. Improving student outcomes is the only reason school systems exist. There are many details involved in improving student outcomes, but from the perspective of the owners of the school system, the community, they all collapse into two primary considerations which student outcomes should be focused on and the circumstances that avoid along the way the values of the parent. And the function of the school board is to represent the vision, the value of the community, effective representative of the community's vision, and listening to the vision and values, identifying the vision and values, and implementing the school system for to ensure alignment with these values and vision. My question is, you've always said that we can't do anything because the state were you there at the state advocating for our students? Because I was, and a lot of other people were. A lot of parents and grandparents were. And we did advocate for our students. Were you? My name is Jim Davis, a resident from Dayton. Uh, a lot of conversation has been surrounding what the school board is obligated to do. And that question obligated is important. And uh, Trustee Belize asked, well, what would be the penalty if we didn't? I think that's an excellent question. And I think if the state of Nevada, and this is an extreme example, I'll, I'll admit extreme example to make the point, said we're going to mandate teaching of Nazism and hatred of Jews. That's the state policy. You as a school board are obligated to rubber stamp that and just pass it through, right? I contend you would not. You would say we're not going to do that. That's a point we're not going to comply with. And you take it as a badge of honor to pay a $250 fine or potentially even lose your jobs 
if you didn't comply. In addition to not complying, you can sue the state. That's within the school board's capability to bring a lawsuit. And I'll bring your attention to a recent example in the state of California. In the county of Shasta, the county board of supervisors said, well, the governor said we had to do this. And while other counties didn't comply, this county board rubber stamped the state of California governor's mandate and made it the mandate in Shasta County, proving that uh, this was not a legal mandate. Eventually, the lawsuit was made by others, not Shasta County, and the court determined that that was not a legal mandate by the state of California. So I would encourage you to decide where your line is, because there's some things you'd be willing to go to the line for, and other things you're not. I would encourage you not to be a rubber stamp board, but to look out for the best. What happened in Jackson County? There was a recall. The board president was recalled, and someone was put into a place that would listen to the constituents. Yes. Thank you. Here at least, and I just want to make a quick comment. I'll have other comments when we get to the item. I've heard an awful lot about what you can't do because you're restricted by, or you're directed by, or you're afraid of losing funding, or you might be fined. I'll tell you what, stand up and I'll pay your fine person. <laughs> And it doesn't change the fact that you're looking to make decisions that you do have the decision on that are in opposition to what the public wants and what they've employed you by virtue of their vote to represent. So I want you to be very, very aware of the fact that you may stand on this principle of we don't have a choice. Be careful with the choices that you make because the choices that you do have are supposed to represent the voices that are trying as best we can to support you. And let me tell you what, if you'll stand, we'll stand with you. My name is Dennis Hubbard. I live in Dayton. Um, I've heard several board members mention the re repercussions if you go against the curriculum that the state passes down. <coughs> and time and again, you said, "Well, we have to we have to use this curriculum because that's what the state has done." <coughs> so you're saying we will yield to the state? That's what you're saying, correct? Can I say what I'm saying personally? Sure. So for me personally, go get involved with the thing. They have opportunity. They have opportunity. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, President Cooley. Um, but I think that again is why all of you have been voted and are sitting behind the table. <laughs> But the point that I want to make is that you will stand and say, we have to do what the state says. Well, I'm here to say you also have to do what the Supreme Court says. And so often, I feel that those that are standing for morality, those that are standing for what is right, that we're on the defense. Well, look, all of you in the audience, I'll let you know that I'm going on to open this. A part of that was the things that are coming into the public school system, things that we are opposed to, can be countered by giving children the opportunity if they want to learn about God and to learn about Jesus and to learn that they were created and that they are loved. And so, just to let you know, not only do you have the answer to the state, 
The Supreme Court has already ruled you have to allow that into the public schools after school if you allow other clubs into your schools, and you do. So I'm just putting, making you aware that that is by intention. And your legal counsel, you know, is quite aware of what I'm saying is true. And I, I hope we don't have to go down a road that becomes very contentious because I'll tell you why. The lives, the hearts, the souls of the children are worth it. And I will stand and I don't know what I'm saying. Good evening. My name is Lori Olson, and I've lived here in Silver Springs for 16 years. Um, it was a very good question that Ms. Julio, and that, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, asked. Um, what are our legal requirements? Well, you're legally required to educate and protect the children of Lyon County. You're legally required to file your taxes timely. You're legally required to request grant funds timely. So you have a lot of legal requirements. You don't get to you can choose which ones we fall on the sword for. You have to either do the law or not. All right, anybody else for public participation? Seeing that, I will close it at this time and we'll move down to. Item number 10, the consent agenda. Looking for a motion. I have a question on the consent agenda. Go ahead, Mr. Hender. Um, item number nine on travel. I was looking at it. And at the top, it says all requests must be submitted to the district office a minimum of four weeks prior to the board meeting. It's the 27th of June. And I'm looking at the dates on here early into June, which is by my math, less than a month. So I'm wondering if we could on this item to a later date so it does meet the criteria stated at the top of the page. Okay. Page 139. Are we talking about the WIDA conference or something else? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of conferences here, one in Wisconsin, one in Arizona. And just, the dates in here vary, but they're all in June. And it says we a minimum of four weeks prior to the board meeting. Okay. All travel must have prior approval of the superintendent or board of trustees. All requests, this is a request, must be submitted to the district office a minimum of four weeks prior to a board meeting. This is a board meeting. This request was made early in this month, which does not meet the four week requirement. I don't care when the conference is. Okay, I mean, I think there's still, I mean, there's time that we could uh, pull it from the agenda and have it resubmitted. Um, no, I think it's going to probably gain the cost of the conference is going to go up because we're going to be closer to the date. But it's, uh, oh, it's just a matter of if the ball rules or we don't. Mentioned that uh, the first thing on the top of this conference is equity and social justice. And um, the lessons are lessons that shape our ever evolving approach and mindset. They want to change the way our children think. Just exactly what the National Geographic test that we've got the same thing. They want to change the way our children think. And it's up to the parents, not us savvy books and sending people to conferences like this. Uh, yeah, I moved to the consent agenda with frequently travel requests 
Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Second. Do you approve the consent agenda with the exception of going to uh, the conference to be submitted at the next meeting? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimously, all right, let's go down to okay, moving down to item number 12 discussion of possible action regarding the DAF new warranty for Silver Mine Middle School, deciding to be presented by legal counsel Don Mine, executive director of operations on the main and fiscal services officer Kyle Rogers. Um, um, what is going to be required here if you take action? I want to get some background and go over the scenario so both the board and the public have an idea of what's going on. Um, this has to do with a significant roof issue at Silverman the Middle School. And this was a school that was completed in 2011. And it was uh, built by Raphael Construction Company. Um, in the last five years, there have been some significant roof issues, uh, 15 weeks over a five year period, uh, all of which um, were submitted to the subcontractor GAF, GAF, um, and they did pay and approve those repairs. Um, Unfortunately, when the general contractor uh, completed this job, and they, they used the subcontractor and they put a product on that was um, <laughs> an issue. And they have a warranty. And we, uh, Mr. Baines and uh, others in the district, were dealing with the warranty company. They got a letter from their lawyer, so they got me involved. And I looked at um, the issue and I looked at the warranty. And under the warranty, there is a requirement the gap roofing that is uh, located in New Jersey uh, mediate uh, all issues before litigation. So we made a request as a district on May 25th. Uh, I sent a letter uh, to their legal counsel. Uh, requesting mediation so we can take this to mediation before a mediator and I suggested three mediators. I got a response back within 10 days saying that they were not willing to mediate this issue. Uh, they did offer uh, alternative solutions. One was a payment, a cash payment of six, $600,005. The other was to do a repair which um, we hired a roof expert, a gentleman by the name of Ray Crook, who's been working with the facility company here in the Spains uh, to go in and take a look at it. Um, he looked at their proposed repair, and his belief is, and I agree, that it does not meet the legal requirements. It would significantly reduce the warranty that the district now has on the roof. It does not meet code requirements, and I will give you an example of that. Um, this roof has, has, particularly with the winter that uh, Northern Nevada experienced, has uh, moisture, significant moisture that's uh, down into the roof area, and you would have to do a moisture, um, they go in and evaluate where the moisture is and dry it out, and that's a code requirement before you do a repair. Um, they also, their repair is to put an existing layman over the, the already existing roof, which reduces the district's ability to repair if there is an additional leak. Also, the, the warranty that now exists from wall to wall would be reduced, which could be a significant financial impact. Uh, Mr. Baines and the facility people um, to the expert got an estimate of the cost for the district to re completely repair and replace this roof. He gave us a range of between 1.2 million and 1.6 million. So if the 
gap roofing is only willing to pay uh, a little over six hundred thousand dollars. That's uh, under fifty percent. So the district is now in a situation well where the company will not honor its warranty. Uh, they are offering offering uh, a significantly reduced cash settlement, which means the district would would have to come out of pocket to pay the, for the additional repairs. Uh, additionally, um, it was determined in March of 2023, just recently, that this roof is no longer repairable. The expert indicates that we have about a two-year window in order to get this completed and done. So that puts the board in a situation where they have to make a determination as to what they do. Um, some all the alternatives that I will go through and answer the questions that you may have. Um, number one, we could accept, accept the cash payment of six hundred and five thousand, which means the district would have to come out of pocket, uh, probably six or seven hundred thousand dollars to complete the repair. They could allow the other repair, which I not would not recommend, and our expert is not recommending because it doesn't meet the total plans. So we can't we can't put a, a school uh, or, or students in general that we can work on that you're just going to have to repair in a couple of years. The other alternative is to um, file a legal action, unfortunately, um, in order to force them into mediation. In the courts in the state of Nevada, most judges, um, once you you start the process, require all parties to go to a settlement conference, which is the very same thing as mediation. Uh, it is my feeling that if we this unfortunately is a company that's in New Jersey, they could probably not even point to firmly on the calendar or on the map. So they're not. They're not giving it what I uh, would consider um, the significance that it means to this district and the cost that it means to this district. So, um, in order to force them into mediation or a settlement conference, I think it will require uh, a legal action. We could always send a letter back saying, well, we disagree with your 605,000, you know, make some significantly reduced offer. But I, I don't think at that point in time uh, that would be advisable. So, and, and then one final thing in order to go forward, forward in any arena, whether it's through mediation, whether it's legally, it's going to be it's going to take a requirement that the district obtain a bid, which means that we're going to have to go through the uh, bid process, have our experts put, put together some. Uh, specifications for the repair or the replacement and put it out to bid and see what the actual uh, bid document says and what the cost is going to be. Our experts just getting us a range and we need to know with more specificity and before you could approve this, you would need to have an actual bid. That puts the district in a, in a position that if we had to go to mediation, we have a bid or a couple of bids that we could submit to the roofing company and say, hey, this is what it's going to cost us. Uh, it also puts us in a position that if we do go to court, we have an expert with a bid who can present to the court um, and have the court make a decision on it. So in under any scenario, uh, if, and if you went to mediation in the third scenario, you're going to have, have a bid for the mediator to look at. So as, at a minimum, I think you need to put this out to bid so we have an actual um, identifiable cost that we can present to whatever the next step is. Um, it also may be an alternative that you can go forward on two different fronts. You can get the bid, so everybody knows what this is going to cost and what the replacement is going to be. Uh, I will say if you go out and get a new road, you're going to have a new, new uh, warranty. Uh, so there will be some additional time on that. But we're eight years and it's already existing 20 year uh, warranty. The other recommendation that I would make and I would ask you to consider is moving forward on two fronts. And this was a suggestion by Mr. Baines, which I think is a good one. Uh, to get a bid, 
so everybody knows what the amount is and to also start legal action. Now, when you start legal action, that's that's a big expense. But my suggestion is to start that so that we are in a position where we can force this company to, first of all, come to Nevada and mediate this and take it with um, uh, the importance that it has for this district. So those are the alternatives uh, that I see. And with that, I would answer any questions that the, the board may have regarding this issue. Really, I've got a question. Um, how do you think you get us the information on the bonding on the board? Do you get it to us before we make a decision? I mean, I think you can send it out to bid, but I think you've only made you know legal decisions. I think you should at least have you know what the bond says, you know, what the board says. Uh, I can with almost certainty tell you that the bond has been released. I can take a look at it and, and, and let you know, but um, you know, we're eight years into this. You know, they usually release the bond um, after a period of time when the certificate of occupancy is, is given to the district. Uh, it's usually under two years, but I can take a look at that. It's going to put you farther down the road. And Bonding companies don't just roll over. It's going to take a real effort to get that. And I think under any scenario, you need to go out and bid and find out the cost, whether you go after the bond or not. The warranty was provided to you in a litigation gathering some time ago. It's, it's a one page document, which um, my father would call a taillight guarantee. Uh, it, it's not anything that we were able to negotiate when that school was built. It was something that your general contractor obtained, uh, and we did not have the opportunity as a district to negotiate really, that contract. Right, the subcontractor of the original company is making the right. That's correct, under the direction of the general contractor, Lafayette. You don't think that they would have tried to cover themselves in any way? I just would like to see the warranty bonding permit. Well, uh, I can give you the warranty again. And so you see it, it provides the mediation. And then it, it's just a one page document that says they'll, they'll warranty this roof for 20 years. Or eight years into it, five years have been uh, with significant weights. But I can provide that information to you. Yeah, um, I know that over the years, this roof has been fixed over and over multiple times and it's still having a problem. And if it doesn't get resolved and replaced, it can cause more damage and be more expensive to our, to our school district. So I am in favor of getting the roof completely replaced and having the warranty put in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this roof was installed in 2011? Yes. So we're ways into it. We're not getting any response from the company that would have to pay up for this repair. So I guess we're looking for some leverage to try to get them in a, get us in a better position to negotiate, which number one is a, a bid. So we can show them actual cost to us to replace this roof. And then starting a suit so that they know that we're serious. That is a good assessment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, board discussion on the site. At this point, uh, we have any questions for you guys. I'll let you go back and we'll open it up for public comment. If we have Comment to make on item number 12. Seeing none, we'll close that at this point and look for a motion. I move that we go forward and get a bid on retaking the roof and then seek our further legal options. Second. So I have a motion by Ms. Pearson and second by Ms. Malai. Any further discussion? 
they got all the better things by saying I, I, I think any of us. I pass it seven two zero, and at this point, I will take a ten minute break. <laughs>
All right, we're going to call it piggyback order. And we're on item number 13 discussion of possible action regarding revisions to LCSD policy EDE for meeting the senior notice and agenda at the second and final reading. This item is presented by myself and work for the receiver. Okay. Uh, this is the second reading. There's um, a change in there. Um, we just went through session and the 75 uh, passed, which was saying that um, after 1159 on the day of the board meeting, cannot take action. And so it doesn't uh, go into effect until July 1st, but since we're on the um, policy, we just got it in now. Um, so I think that's the only thing. Right, that one. Okay, that's the only thing from the last meeting. So I'm looking for board comments. So my question is, after 15 years or more of using one version of open meeting law, why you propose this change? I don't think we've used one version. We've just been doing the combination. There is no combination. There's you, one or the other. Correct, but then you are not limited to doing extra if you would like. This is not extra. It clearly states in there one or the other. And what right. we've been doing is public comment at the beginning for three minutes, and then after discussion, on every single agenda item, we allow the public to speak for three minutes on every single agenda item. And then at the end, they get three minutes. Correct. And that's what we've always done here. Now you're proposing that, that the public not be allowed to speak after we have discussion on any agenda item. What I'm saying is we have been doing a combination going above and beyond of what's required. A combination of things. How are we going to call it above and beyond? Because we've been doing both of oh, No, there, we haven't been doing both. We've been doing the second one. No, because we've been having comments at the beginning of the meeting, at the end of the meeting, and additionally on every single agenda item. That's the second version. No, the second version is only on agenda items. Negative. That's incorrect. That is correct. That's incorrect. Bridget, you really need to learn the statute. Uh, that's right. I can get that brought up and, and read it to you. I have it right here, too. Right. There we go. Yep, I got it, too. Okay, any okay. further? Uh, can I have a copy of that? Okay, any further uh, board discussion? No, I have, I have further discussion. I do too. Um, oh. You know, just in general, you can see what the public wants. Why are you go, why are you backing against it so hard? <laughs> So I, I believe that we heard from the public that is here. There's a whole another side of the public too that are parents of who within our district. Sure, Jim. The only agenda I can see is just like Mr. Farr said. He wants to go home. My agenda and back itself, and that's what I said. I said, the meetings are going to Excuse me, sir, I have the floor. Yeah, floor, right? that's what let's get sort of respectful, please. I said the meetings have gone so long that I actually had to contribute this to the last meeting, but I received complaints, who is received complaints, prepared to go, they want to wait, they want to do their comment. The way we talked about the format is, they can't do it until the end of the meeting, and they're in the meeting four and a half, five hours, because in the middle on certain agenda items, certain board members would like to turn this into political theater and it takes too long. 
That is my comment. Well, yeah. Where are all these people that you speak of? They're certainly not here tonight. So, Ms. Carson, but you you asked me what my agenda is. My agenda is kids and parents. Oh, That's it. Yeah. Really? How, how much volunteer time do you give to the kids of our district? Um, how much volunteer time do you give to the kids of our district? Uh, so, I can read the statute here. The second alternative also involves multiple periods of public comment which must be heard after discussion of each agenda item, but before the public body takes action on the item. And then finally, which applies to both of these, regardless of which alternative is selected, the public body must, must allow the public some time before adjournment to comment on any matter within the public body's jurisdiction, control, or advisory power. This would include items not specifically included on the agenda as an action item. So that's where we have discussion at the beginning and the end on items that are not on the agenda currently as required that's and item. on every agenda item. That's item. Yes, and that's what you're trying to eliminate by going to item number one now. You're trying to eliminate public comment on agenda items after we sit here and discuss them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any further uh, board comments? Mr. President. Good. I just want to say, you know, I appreciate all the people that came out tonight. This is the most people I've seen in the board meeting. I may have only been on the board now for, you know, a little over two months. Uh, and I'd love to have participation. That's why I did it. Um, and I just want to say, that, you know, your voices are heard. And personal opinions may be remembered to be taken out of this. Me as a board member, I'm one vote, but I represent my whole district. And so I need to take my personal opinion out of um, certain things that I may disagree with and try to be a good constituent to my district. Um, so like I, I appreciate everybody that's been here tonight and, and voiced their opinion. To me, that is a very important thing to hear from the teacher, to hear from the parents and to hear from the public. Because that weighs heavily on on what I do. Um, like I said, I'm one vote and I'm one person, but I represent district um, district seven, and so for that reason, I'm not really in favor of it because I don't like taking um, the opinions of the public um, out. So I just want to thank you. Thank you. All right, any further board comments? Seeing none, I will open it up for public discussion at this point. Mr. Gray. Thank you. I'm sorry to stand one little segment over here, real quick. Uh, so, uh, for the record, Ken Gray, I was going to be here just uh, speaking on behalf of myself, resident, uh, Lyon County parent, uncle, still has two kids in the school district, and up until uh, June, had a daughter teaching the district. But, um, so I'm going to just go ahead and read my comments here real quick. So it's not here representing myself. Thank you all for stepping up to represent us. This board is probably the most important board in this county. We've entrusted you with our most precious resource in the state, our children. Um, I've known several of you for quite a while and do like and respect you. Uh, Mr. Workman, you know I've been involved in you know, education for a long time. You know, we always got, I think Mr. Logan, uh, we've known you for a while there, known you for a while, even though know, we disagree on things uh, quite often, but you know, that doesn't negate the fact that you guys have stood up and answered the call of the public. Um, we, uh, uh, and I'm really encouraged by the, uh, the attendance there tonight. Um, so often the school board meetings go without notice. And again, if you guys are working with our valuable resources in the state, so what I'm hoping is that this carries over into election time and we get more people and good people to run. Not that any of you aren't good, I'm just saying when you have a choice, it's better. You know, unfortunately, Mr. Farr was the only one that stood up. Um, so there was like an election there. Uh, he's really no better than being appointed in position. Um, 
Mr. Spark, thank you for the very kind of introduction. First of all, uh, yeah, I do appreciate that for bringing that up because uh, you did not uh, call me on the agenda item was uh, for the legislature. So let me address that law real quick and see where you stand after that. Um, why did I vote to change and interrupt uh, about OML? Well, because a certain group uh, known as the uh, the left wanted to attach an amendment to that bill, allowing transgender students that by the transgender into bathrooms um, and other facilities, you know, that are used by normative students. Uh, that was wholly unacceptable, I think, uh, in the public school sector, as did most of my caucus. So we decided to vote in favor of that if they dropped that in, which they did. Um, so if you were in favor of that, hey, stand up and take credit for it. But that's why I voted for it, so we wouldn't have the, uh, the transgender issue further push down the uh, further push down our throats. Um, the second reason is the reason that OML was changed in the primary reason was to allow an option for public comment that would actually go quicker when there was nobody in the room and you did not have to uh, have it have public comment offered or proffered after every agenda item. Um, there's a lot of meetings. You guys are not the only board in the state. Uh, there are many boards that have no public intent that after every agenda item, they still offer public comment after every single agenda item. It's just, it made the board president look stupid or the chairman of the board. It just didn't make any sense. May I uh, please take a little personal five minutes, uh, personal up there since I want to tax it when I just report it. I come. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, also, uh, you know, how can the public make informed comment if they haven't heard the presentation? They need to hear the presentation that's before you guys before they can offer comments. A lot of times, just hearing the presentation will resolve issues in their mind and, you know, get rid of uh, misinformation. Doing it before they hear it, or I mean, doing it before you guys hear it, or after you hear it makes no sense. I mean, if you've already taken action, why comment? If they don't know anything about it, why comment? So I would encourage you to do that. And just because the and the NRS says may, not shall, um, just because you are allowed to do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. The right thing to do in your case is to listen to the parents and taxpayers of this county as you are their elected representatives. The legislature and DOCC allow public comment before, during, and after uh, agenda items. They also allow Zoom participation. They also allow written comment uh, to be uh, proffered and read into the record. You know, I would uh, opine to you that if they can find the time to do this at their levels, you should be able to. Um, and, and this probably go back real quick. I don't remember what you speaking with me about the issue um, you know, that's before us today. I will say, however, I had very, very nice productive conversations with Mr. Cooey as well as Mr. Hendricks. Um, and I really appreciate you guys reaching out to speak with me and explain what's going on. Didn't really change my mind much, but I do appreciate that. So if you guys really want to speak these meetings along and conduct better meetings, this is what I suggest. There are tools at your disposal. First, lay down the rules for public comment. Second, adhere to the rules yourselves and maintain control of the meeting. Say I've seen uh, disruption allowed, comments at the wrong time, engaging in debate. You know, sometimes it's, a, it's appropriate to uh, to offer an answer up or have legal clarify something, but I've seen where you guys have taken comments personally. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be engaging those comments. It belongs to the meeting and just, just not build effective relationships. That's an appropriate time to lost comment. Nobody, the law does not say you have to offer three minutes. On an issue like tonight, what they would do in the legislature, what they would do in the legislature, if they would, okay, we've got 100 people, we've got a park out front, we're not allowed 90 minutes for pro, 90 minutes against, and 90 minutes uh, in neutral. And that would equate to usually about a minute per person. And if there was time, they would go back and catch other people. But nothing says you have to allow a certain amount of time. That does several things for you. It allows people to actually get to their point, get to it quickly, and not repeat each other. And everybody's getting their point across. It allows everybody the opportunity to get their comments out there. Um, so what I would suggest to you, Mr. Cooley, is you and the board should receive training on conducting effective meetings. Your legal counsel is also doing you a disservice. Things have been discussed tonight, which are not in the agenda. We just saw that a few minutes ago. Also, board members are not being recognized before speaking. I gotta say, it's pretty funny to see Mr. Carr engage with a member of the audience to say, you haven't been recognized, the floor is mine. Actually, the floor wasn't here, Mr. Carr. The, the president 
had uh, had recognized uh, this person. You stepped on her. So I would, you know, I would really be cautious. And uh, if I were you, I'd go through your chair and request time that you so he could conduct a second meeting and maintain control. All right, Mr. Gray, I think, I think we've given you the time. Okay, I, I appreciate it. I'll wrap up if you wouldn't mind. I will. Uh, Incidentally, the Eagles will have to have their back to us today. I don't know if that's some kind of a sign, but I think we need to turn those Eagles around. Um, they should be looking at us and hearing our comments, not turning their backs on us. So I stand uh, ready for any comments. Okay, I'll turn it over to Good, good evening. My name is Fred Schroeder. I'm a voting resident, citizen of Lyon County. I live in Dayton. I disagree with your proposed public comment changes at your meeting. And I've tried to whittle my comments down, thinking that you were probably going to reduce some time. So I'll get started to the point. I'm having great difficulty understanding why you would restrict the voices of parents and residents to the beginning or end of a meeting rather than when an issue is actually being debated and considered. Allowing us to speak during the debate helps shine light on an issue through our voices. Limiting our voices gives the appearance, if not reality, of keeping truth and information in darkness or hidden. So I ask you three simple questions for your consideration. One, do you believe that we the people would prefer to speak during the debate rather than a time unattached from the issue. Two, do you believe allowing parents and residents to speak during the debate in consideration is the right thing to do? Three, do you believe the impact of public comment is greater when verbally part of the debate versus attached from the debate? I'll give you my answers, which I believe represent the residents of County as well. Yes, we the people would prefer to speak when an issue is being considered. We don't want, want our voices limited to a different time frame. Two, yes, allowing our voices during the actual debate is the right thing to do. You believe that this change is allowed by state law and is legal. That doesn't make it the right thing to do. The second option in that state law is currently being used comment during the debate or consideration and is legal in part of the law, making it unnecessary to make a change. Three, yes, of course, the impact of public comments during the debate is greater. While it's good to have various options for our voices to be heard, the impact is greater when spoken to you directly like we are right now when we're debating the issue. In conclusion, parents and residents demand to speak when an issue is being considered. It's the right thing to do and is legal. And the impact is greater when spoken to you directly during a debate. There's no other right answer. Reject the proposal regarding public comments at your meeting and allow us to shine, shine light on an issue as it's being considered and debated. And I thank you for your consideration. Setting aside the public statement by Trustee Farr and the main board that he cannot be bothered to stick around and serve the citizens of Lyon County for too long, just why are you so afraid to let Lyon County citizens speak on each of his eyes before you vote to Since you are both responsible for this agenda, what motivates your need to tell Lyon County citizens to shut up? Are you, like Trustee Farr, unwilling to stick around for long for me to discuss difficult topics of concern to taxpayers in Bryan County? If yes, then there's an easy answer. Resign. Yeah. Reportedly, President Curry has been telling folks in Lyon County that what this board majority has proposed to do is legal. Well, President Curry, just in case you did not know, many things are legal, but they are not right. And in writing from the citizens of Lyon County in fear that you might learn something new before you vote. Well, that may cover you with the fig leaf of legality, but everyone knows it is not right. 
Put it simply, everyone knows fear when they see it. Again, you need leadership. We need more like trusting Hendricks and Parsons, who have voted to protect our students from Marxist curricula and who will vote to allow students' parents to speak on each and every agenda item for this board. This is not about you, for the majority member, who thinks spending a few hours each month listening to Lyon County citizens somehow such an overwhelming burden that you feel the need to tell your citizens to shut up. We do not need those who continue to run away in fear of transparency and accountability to run away from my encounter. This is a call for mature and responsible leaders who do not fear but embrace the input of my county citizens. Our next election cannot come soon enough. My name is Jim Davis, I'm from Dayton. When I came into the school tonight, I saw a big billboard with certain tenets about values here at the school. One of them struck me, and it is this, be fair, include others. I think that's a really important tenet that we should abide by. Earlier, President Cowan used the uh, uh, athletic analogy, a baseball analogy in his comments. And to that point, someone could say, well, we're being fair, we're including others. We have this person on our team. Mm -hmm. We've got this great place for you. It's called the bench. We're on the team, but you're on the bench and not on the field. And that's what it feels like to me as a resident when the board proposes to relegate comments to before the proposal item where the comments are out of context and not attached to the item, or after the vote has been taken, where they're completely meaningless. So those two options, before is a poor way to do it, after is a meaningless way to do it, and I would encourage you to reject that idea. Trustee Farr, in his comments, seemed to lay out the legal case, that this is absolutely legal if we do this. And like a previous commenter, I want to draw the distinction between legal and right. Is it legal to cheat on your wife? Yeah. Is it, is, is it right? No. So this legal stance sets the bar essentially at an angle level. What is right, that bar is set up here. And I want to encourage the board to not just look at the legal hurdle, but see what is the right thing for the constituents of the county to do. And I would encourage you to reject this proposal to relegate comments to before and after the meeting and continue to accept comments as we are today during the discussion item. If there's so many people that want to discuss an item, that it's so important that the room gets filled and everybody wants to talk about it, then it's important enough to take the time to hear their voice. And if a meeting or a topic needs to be uh, continued to another meeting to accommodate those voices, well, so be it. Uh, it's important enough to hear the voices instead of just move on. When I read this law about these two options, and one of them being, you could just do it before and after the meeting. That's a legal thing. I wondered why that would be. And it struck me as the only reason that the legislature would include that in the law was to enable officials intent on a certain policy direction to more or less ignore the public. They can check the box and say it's legal, but they didn't really accept meaningful comment from the public by relegating it to before and after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. James Whistler firm. I'm also opposed to the change of this. We've been doing it this way for quite a while, and the change is kind of ridiculous. One, it does silence us, even though you want to say it doesn't. It is important that we be able to hear the discussion between board members and then decide what we want 
to have you vote in that favor. But you are not voting in the favor of the parents, you're voting in the favor of your stuff. Last meeting, Mr. Park, you did yell, it's been four hours, it's on video. Anybody can pull it up. Not only that, during the meeting, you got so frustrated, you threw some papers at one of the other board members, Mr. Hinder. That is not very conductive of a professional. You mentioned you served like I did and many others here, then you should be against this because that constitutional oath we swore to would not defend what the board is trying to do, regardless of whether it's legal or not. It is not right. In three minutes at the beginning of the meeting for me to talk on five, six, seven subjects or agenda items, you're not going to really hear them and you're probably going to forget most of what I said. Then I've noticed something. How come all of the important stuff that the parents want to talk on are at the very end? Maybe put them at the beginning so we can get that done. You can hear the comments and you may not be here for four hours. It's a tactic. That tactic is to hopefully maybe people will get bored and want to quit waiting and go home. Okay? You hear all the mm -hmm. don't yeah. tell me I'm wrong. It's a self-serving change. Self-serving. And only three of the members voted in opposition to the change. You should not be wanting to change something that is good. This is most people I've seen in the two, three months I've come to these. And I hope everyone continues to come back and continues to let their voices be heard and continues to fight against the things that they're not in agreement with. You serve the people. I said it last time. You are voted in. You are servants of the public. So do like I suggested last time. Let that backbone show. Stand up for the people, not for yourself. My name is Roberta Simon, and I am from Bacon, and I have the proud privilege of having 23 children in this school district for so many years. Anyway, what I want to say that I've learned is tonight, I have been in more IEPs than any parents I know. I was always taught to be a team player. I don't see a team in front of me. I wish I did. I wish I was more elegant, eloquent than a lot of people that have come before me. But as a team player, we sit and we act like we're listening, even if we're not. Some of you have, are, are coming across to me as you're disengaged. We are here because we care. I have been at other board meetings because I care. I have sat with many of the people that are on district level and higher in meetings. They know me. I wish that I had a feeling that some of you did. Then I would feel that our vote and our voice is being heard. We need to be heard. We have a right to be heard. You say you're transparent. You put across all of that. You ask how you can build up trust in your parents. Act like you care if you do, and act like you're not dismissing us. You know who you are, and so does everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Good evening, um, Anna Bernan, and I just want to say that I do not support this. Um, if a meeting goes too long, it it does go long. It shouldn't be shortened, or it should it should stay long by that public comment. And when you remove that public comment from each agenda item, it kind of puts across that you don't care what the residents or the parents are saying. And one other thing is you were voted into these positions. You all, I don't envy any of you. You all have a very important job. These children are our future. And you were voted in to represent the parents and the citizens of this county. And I mean, I know the majority here are against the proposal. I don't know about people that wrote in or whatever, but 
To me, it seems like if the majority of the residents that voted you in represent them are against this, then that is, is what you should do is do the right thing and allow public comment to continue after each agenda item. Thank you. My name is Gary Lee, I'm the senior pastor at Calvary Chapel Bay Valley. And tonight I'm here on behalf of the kids of this community to express my concerns and shock over this board's consideration to limit the parents and concerned citizens to speak on the case of their children's education. As a concerned member of this community, I'm appalled that those elected to represent the best interests of children, parents, and citizens would seek to limit the voices of those who elected them. Any official that would limit or dismiss the public comment is showing disrespect for those who, live, who elected them. This action fundamentally and inappropriately changes what is a taxpayer public funded school system, a system that's designed to be responsible to the will of the people, and it changes it to a government institution. A government institution with no need for direction or input from those deemed unimportant to the process. By limiting the ability of people to engage on critical issues of education, you're effectively saying that the education of your child is no longer your business. The overwhelming response that you've received from present concerned citizens here this evening as well, and the great reminder is that it is of a representation that you hold as a, as a responsibility to those elected you. It's apparent that, you, that the concern of the members of this community, some to the point of outrage, have provided sufficient cause for you to dismiss this as unacceptable and inappropriate. In a discussion with a board member, it was expressed that the public comments have turned these board meetings into a circus. In so doing, that the meetings run too long, complaints from the people who want to make the comments want to leave. It's also been said that there are those who complain about the length and that they want to have opportunity to speak. And I, again, would challenge you to find those people present in this room this evening. And I'm sure that the, the comments that have been about the board meeting running law are far less than the comments tonight that are requesting that you allow people to continue to speak. It's also been said that this action doesn't take away the opportunity for people to speak. It just changes and places it in a different position. The argument at best is an attempt to obscure that this action would take away the opportunity for parents to express concern when the item is being discussed. Three minutes at the beginning of a meeting to address multiple agenda items is not a suitable replacement for time allotted during each item being discussed. Those in favor of this change are saying we shouldn't talk about an issue for three minutes before we talk about it, but your comments aren't important enough for us to listen to it while we're discussing it. In effect, we're not worthy of your time to hear our concerns as it pertains to the items that are being discussed. Taking away the voice of people for the sake of expediency is removal of the citizens' right to self government This is without a doubt against every design and purpose of the public school system. In closing, I'd remind you that you've been elected to represent the will of the people. It's been made clear that the will of the people is to have a voice in the process of educating the children. Should you continue in advance to advance this change, it is clear that you put your individual will above that of the people. Thank you. Thank you, people have the right to about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dean Kendrick, and I'm a citizen of Dean. Um, I'm here. I taught in Lyon County School District. I actually got to teach your son, Owen. Okay. Um, I think you know how important it is to hear from parents, from citizens. If I didn't care about you or your child, you would have had me fired. And that same goes here. If I didn't listen to the parents of the children that were in my classroom, I wouldn't have a job. Because those are our kids, those are your kids, those are the ones that you care about. So when we look at this board meeting and we say we only want comment at the beginning and the end, it makes no sense because you're not caring about those individual items. I'm willing to sit here for five hours if that's how long it is for my voice to be heard. The same that I would sit for five hours as a teacher in a school to listen to concerned parents if there was something that was going on inside of my classroom that involved students. I am completely opposed to this. Please, please let parents and citizens 
have comments during those agenda items because that's where you're going to hear the part of the people. You guys are going to remember everything at the beginning of the meeting, and it doesn't matter at the end. That's already been voted. So that it, it makes no sense. Listen to the people that are here because we care. We're not coming at you. We want to stand behind you. We voted you guys in to be our voice. Be our voice. You guys said that it's a legal thing. It's not a legal thing. We already learned that there's two options. You have option one and you have option two. Can we just stick with the option that we've had all along to allow people to speak their heart during these agenda items? If there's items that are important to the people, put them at the beginning of the meeting to allow those people to get their voices heard. Whether that's, I, I don't know the logistics of it all, but let people's voices be heard. We care about the students just as much as you guys do. And if you do care about them, you're going to hear the voices of us at this team. Thank you. My name is Steve Gallistarfer, and I have a new name. Uh, I hear the discussion going back and forth about when comments and questions should be raised. And I'd like to make a little example about the classroom. The math teacher walks in and says, today we're going to talk about quadratic equations. Does anybody have any questions? And they all get a little comment. <laughs> and there's none, because nobody has an idea what a quadratic equation is. So the teacher goes on and teaches for two hours. No questions are allowed till the end. And then they wonder why the kids don't get it. Quadratic equations are complicated. There's things that need to be learned along the way. Why do you do this? What does that parenthesis mean? Can you take this over to there? Can you square this and take the square root there? It's important that input is given along the way. And when you have a complicated agenda, that has a variety of issues on it, those matters need to be discussed along the way. So when people have questions and comments, you as a teacher, if you're a good teacher, are going to learn something from your students. So that the next time something comes up, you have an idea what the students really want and how they learn. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Gilbert Delay. I'm the associate pastor at Calvary Chapel, Dayton Valley. Senator Nicole, you mentioned earlier concerning this proposal that you thought that there were other people that you heard from. The problem with that is that is immeasurable. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how many there are. What I can measure is sitting behind me tonight, well over 100 people have come out here to oppose the position and some of the other members of the board are taking up. We're here to let you know that we have to give our voice. Pastor Lee said in the earlier discussion that if you will stand, we will stand with you. We'll be your advocates. But if you choose to press this through and remain many members of your board, then you're asking us to be your adversaries. And that's not something that we want to do. We want to stand, we want to support. Your job is a very difficult job. You do make sacrifices. These are long nights. I know what long board meetings are like. So we appeal to you. We consider what you're seeking to do based on what you see behind me. Support you. The voice of the people. Thank you. My name is Tamara Tui. I am a resident of Dayton. I have children in the school district. I'm a substitute teacher in the school system. And I have to respond here. Um, I think we've heard a lot tonight from these folks about what their voice wants to be on this agenda item. But self admittedly, there's maybe some misunderstandings logistically of how board meetings run. I think it's important to point out that the discussion on items don't happen at board meetings. If you want to say something to the board, you can say this at the beginning or the end. It's just a statement. They can't answer you back. There's not a discussion. It's not a roundtable. If you want your voice heard, 
you email, you call, you set up a, an appointment with them, that's how you get your voices heard. You volunteer in the school district. You come into the classroom, you see what's going on. That's how you get your voice heard. I am willing to bet most of you this is your first meeting that you were the head of. But you still don't understand what you're saying. If you say something to the board, they cannot respond. Again, I mean, we're talking about the support of this issue and how this is what the public wants. But if my pastor compared the board to Nazi Germany and this was my chance to stand up for the Jews, I would show up as well. But you came in as good followers. Yes. And I do have to the about and you have any kids that are school district. I have nine grandchildren going to be from the community. Please take the agenda item. I'll say it since the president won't. Oh, thank you. Fair example of maybe how meetings can go different routes. A lot of the concerns today were brought up about education, about, but nothing specific about CRP or this stuff. But nothing specific that's happening in our schools. If you have specific concerns, please bring them to the board to keep asking them for that. This is your first meeting. I'm a baby resident, and I would like to say you guys are doing a 
interesting job maintaining your people there. It's not easy to sit on that side and hear the vitriol that all of us have. But I would like to correct something. Not everyone here has blindly followed their pastor. Mm -hmm. There are atheists, there are Christians, and there are representatives like myself in the pagan community. One thing that is interesting is that you all were voted in as our representative for all of us to stand behind you. You stand in front of us as one voice, the voice of many. We in this audience have also been mischaracterized as parents, guardians, grandparents. You in your general field are all the same. But these children that you guys, we taught them to stay. We taught them to drink with a cup, eat with a spoon, button their shirt, put on their pants, and go to school. We taught them how to share, how to guide their emotions. You might be the professional, but when it comes to the children that come to this school, we, their parents, their guardians, their grandparents, we are the experts. It is our voice that needs to be heard after every single topic that is brought up. You don't get to hear it. You have to hear it. I yield the rest of my time to do it. Hi, my name is Claire Meshberger. I'm a grandmother of a son that's still in Dayton High School. Um, I raised both my boys who've been in Dayton for the last 32 years. I am decidedly so thankful that I don't have a child in your school district today. As far as following the pastor that is represented here tonight, as well, let's put it this way. He's a man of God. He teaches the truth to us. He teaches our children in our church the truth. And I wonder how hard it is for you all who are sitting here paid by us to extend your meaning a few more minutes. How hard is that? You're paid to do this. You're you're responsible, you're supposed to be responsible to us to our children. And I am here tonight on behalf of my grandson, my great granddaughter, who will be in the school district. And I wonder what the world is going to look like. The Bible says we are headed for hell if we don't change our ways. And I believe that the school district needs to straighten up. And you know, <laughs> I don't know how many of you all still have children in school or how many have already had children through school. We need to start looking for the future. And the future is not looking so good. And if you start looking at the amount of homeschooling that's going in place now and how many charter schools are taking place now, and we got a legal representative right here. If you all stand up, could be your legal counsel, who is also paid probably by us. So what's the deal? Why can you not be held accountable and do what's right and not be so concerned about what the state is? Because you know what? I agree with the gentleman who says, I can hardly wait to the next election. I voted for a few of you out here tonight. Hopefully, you want to come to the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andy Zuckerman. I'm in uh, Silver Spring. I have a nine-year-old who just finished third, going into fourth grade here at school. In town. Um, I'm opposed to the measure. The notification that I got from someone, I don't even know how they got my email that I didn't know about this measure, it brought me here. It was you know, the fact that I need to come, that everybody needs to come. This is a school district for the parents, the parents' children, not for you. It's for our children as 
has been pointed out by you guys. And you guys were elected to care for and manage the education for our children. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions, but you guys paid to be here. You guys compensated for your time today. Is that correct? As school board members, we get $400 a month, correct? Man, I don't get any money to be here. 400 doesn't sound like a lot, but zero class. So, <laughs> two things I wanted to point out is like 6% of speech is words. Nino doesn't portray my emotion, my feeling, what things that are important to me. As members of the board, it's your job to know, to speak on our behalf of the people here. You guys are expected to know and have education and knowledge in your field. That's what enables you to do your jobs and do it well. But you're also expected to do what the people in this community would like you to do. That's what you're voted to. That's why they voted for you because they expect that you would follow through and do what they ask. Uh, a couple of things I've noticed because I, I wasn't at the last board meeting, but I did do it. So I spent the four hours. I didn't spend the whole four hours. I skipped a few things. I'm going to admit that. But I watched what was going on and I saw. I noticed a few things, one of which is that the time spent that caused that four hours was not people speaking. People speaking did not take that much time. It took time. It didn't take two hours at least on top of the regular, well, maybe not on top of, but at least two hours was spent talking with a lot of the people coming here to, to go to just regular meeting stuff, which is not stuff that was at the fault of those wishing to speak. Those wishing to speak want to be heard. We would like to have our ability to speak to you before you make your agenda. We may think of something, we may know knowledge that you don't know before you make your decision. It's important that you hear it, that you know what we want before you make your votes on your agenda. Items. Make sure that you're voting on things that we would like you to vote. And it's possible that we may not have the right ideas, the right knowledge. Maybe you know more than us. It's possible. But Okay, I think it's important for you guys to listen to the people at the time of the time to vote for your agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Joan Latimer. I'm from Dayton. Um, to me, and this is my observation, nobody yes. else is, this meeting started off on the wrong foot. These two people offered or made a suggestion to bring up this part at the beginning of the meeting. But the rest of you voted against it. Now here we are. You all wanted to be heard. You wanted to talk about your graduation. You wanted to talk about your baseball game, your sport, this and that. This part, what we're going through right now, could have been done at that time. But instead, you wanted us to listen to you. So now here we are. As a parent, as a grandparent, soon to be a great grandparent, I have volunteered numerous hours in a classroom. As recently as two years ago, I was volunteering in my daughter-in-law's classroom. I was known as Grandma Joan. It was wonderful, and I recommend it that any grandmas or people that don't have children, go volunteer some of your free time in the classroom. You will learn so much. Probably some things you shouldn't learn. It's a very local. So anyway, I'm just saying, Open your ears, open your hearts. You, Mr. Cooey, continue to talk about center field. I asked, and I realized I was out of place. Who is in center field? Is it a child or is it a parent who's yelling and screaming and one thing or another? That can be easily taken care of. If the kids complaining, find out why. There's a reason why people behave the way they do. All it takes is time and an ear and a heart. And that's my ending.
Thank you. Thank you for helping in our classroom. We really appreciate that. Hi, my name is Elaine Turner, and I am a baby, and I have a couple of children, and three have gone through the school system here. Um, I think I just want to address the fact that because it seems to me we were being disregarded because we got our information about what was going on here through a pastor or through maybe who knows what. However, we get our information doesn't make any difference to you. It doesn't negate our opinion. doesn't negate our voices. We're here because it's an informed decision to be here. It has nothing to do with being a follower, as your wife was pointing out, and that was trying to negate us. And that is not the truth. The truth is we're here because we're concerned because we want our voices to be heard. And you have to hear our voices. That's what you are being paid to do. And I know your job is hard, so don't just get me wrong. I really respect that you guys have a job. But you also have the responsibility to listen to us, not negate us, because we get our information about maybe something that's going on through our pastor or through the public uh, announcement that's put up in a library, whatever, how we post them. No matter how we get our information, it doesn't negate our opinion. And it doesn't negate the fact that we are here as one voice saying that we are against this. Having the beginning and the end speaking, I mean, there's been a lot of really good points made tonight about how important it is to get the information, how how we can get our information out to you in during each subject, and that is very important because it is it, it goes in context, it flows. You know, you do it in the beginning like someone said, you do it at the end, it doesn't flow, so it's not really. Doesn't even make any sense. So I just am saying I'm getting it as well, and I think we need to be able to speak during each and every agenda item that we feel we need to speak Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay Wallace. I'm a resident of Bayview, and I'm sorry it's time to go. And do you know that recently we have such a turnout tonight? is we've seen what's going on in school board meetings around our nation, and we are concerned for our children. <clears throat> we love our kids. No, I don't have a kid in the school district, but that doesn't mean I don't care about them. I care about the kids in my church. I work in the nursery. I love the kids. We are concerned, and we want you to hear that. That's why we're here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Greg Koenig. I'm State Assemblyman. I represent District 38, which covers pretty much every high school in Lyon County except for Cape. I'm from Churchill County and grew up in Bowling Hill Generation over there. I started for 12 years on the school board, so I know what it's like to be on the other side of that. I've been in multiple meetings with whole high school gyms full of irritated people. Um, <laughs> Um, I admit that I don't know 100% of the backstory of the reason behind it, but I do know that listening to your constituents is best practice. And when I was school board president, we made sure that we listened to public comment before every vote was taken. Questions were brought up during the presentation so that we went to no one as an audience member to ask until the presentation was made. How would you know what to ask beforehand? Um, I do think that there can be some sort of compromise, like the Timothy Gray mentioned earlier. If you did, if there's a whole bunch of agenda items that you're going to vote on, and there's going to be tons of public comment, you can just limit it to 20 minutes. They say okay, we're going to take 20 minutes of public comment. And that way you're not there for five hours, but people feel like they're heard. Um, I came one to listen and not say anything, but like I always do, I end up saying something and that usually gets me in trouble. But um, you need to listen to people. 
but you also need to control your meeting. And the one in south here, this isn't a public meeting. This is a school board meeting held in public. As a school board meeting, you guys need to control the meeting and your meeting is so, um, that I think we work on where there's some sort of compromise where you can give 15, 20 minutes to public comment. These guys know each other. They can get together and even have a spokesperson or have five spokespersons who take three minutes or whatever it goes, but you need to get to people and get them yeah, yeah. My name is Roger Decker. I live here in Silver Springs. My life has been some key points that have a lot of things to focus in my life about boards, government officials, so on. I had the opportunity to work at the White House. I was there with Nixon, did some things that he shouldn't have done, and he got kicked out. He, he spoke that he didn't do these things, but people knew he did by, by other means. I had communicated with a congressman. The communication that I got back was, I have to vote my part. It wasn't what people wanted. It was what his heart said to him. Was that right? I don't think so. I think he should have been voting with the people wanted. I worked in a country where you couldn't speak of a, about a king. If you spoke about a king in the wrong way, you went to jail. Was that right? No, it didn't give the opportunity to the people to say what they feel. This is giving people the opportunity to say what they feel. Now the question is, have you already decided what you want? All right, any further discussion? I think I will close. Sorry, okay. okay. Hello, I can hear you next from Dayton. So I don't mean to drag this on, but I did have one more question to make. And that is that tonight, as I've listened to the comments from the audience, the public, parents, and responses from the board members, I've heard the phrase misinformation or misrepresenting. And I wanted to read to you a response I got back from one of the board members after reading this to her. And part of the letter said, uh, Thank you for your email. Uh, I am sad to hear it is a fellow board member that is being disingenuous and misrepresenting a draft item for the last meeting. Have you read the draft policy? And it goes on to explain that this is legal. Um, it's disturbing to me that whenever the public is bringing up points, the rebuttal from the trustees seems to be, oh, that's misinformation. And as I'm here tonight listening to the proposal and hearing people talk about it, it's not misrepresentation. That's exactly what you guys are proposing, limiting public comment to only before or only after the meeting instead of during the meeting when it matters. And it's upsetting to me that it's called misinformation, just like Facebook censoring and other things that are going on in the world today. This is true information. And I would like you as trustee you hold the people's trust. We voted for you. We're entrusting you with our children, with the direction of the school. And to me, hiding this information from the public is not only not transparent, it, it causes suspicion. And when people get suspicious, then they're going to give you more scrutiny. They're going to look more carefully at every item that you do, and rightfully so. Because what I've seen tonight is not trustworthiness. 
you have your pillars of character that we try to teach the children citizenship, fairness, trustworthiness, respect. And I'm sad to see that I have not seen very much of that tonight represented amongst yourselves and towards the citizens who have spent their evening tonight and so many hours writing letters to you. To be told, oh, that's misinformation. That was from one of our board members who was disingenuous. And the person they are calling disingenuous is so far the only one I see as genuine and, and trustworthy. Um, and I would ask you guys to look at your own hearts and think about, are you being trustworthy with the trust that people have given you? And are you really trying to do what's right for our kids and for our community? And if that's not your heart, then step aside and let someone else be a board of trustees. Uh, and if that is your heart, then please don't miss your representative and take what's legal to do instead of what's right to do. The parents and the citizens and the taxpayers have a right to be heard. Thank you. Hello, again, my name is Sean Newman. From the Can you hear me now? Good evening. I'm Glenn Thomas from Dayton, a graduate of Dayton High School. My mother was also a very strong part of this community. We had 32 different kids come through our house, whether they got kicked out of their own. We had a 90% succession rate of kids getting out of their house, into ours, and graduating school. Those days are long since gone because some of those people that were in charge, teachers, board members, everything like that, saw the value in it. I see the value in people that help out. My wife has volunteered every Friday at our local school with my kids in it for the last year. She's put in a lot of time. I've put in a lot of time helping her. i put in a lot of money including paying taxes that pays all your guys' wage. I know it pays your wage because grants and everything else come out of my pocket because money just doesn't fall out of the sky. I would like to see more transparency out of stuff for everything that's done because I always find the money somewhere, whether it's in my own pocket or somebody else. I'm just kind of concerned with where things are going, and I would rather see things be on the up and up instead of being hidden and behind closed doors. Thank you. So I was sitting in back there, I, I hadn't planned on coming up here at the end to speak that this portion. Um, Can you please take your name for the record. Yes, my name is Dennis Hubbard. I'm from Dayton. I'm a pastor of church here in Silver Springs, and I work in Gardnerville, so I move around a bit. And what I was thinking about in back as I was sitting there is I have the privilege of overseeing um, for Douglas County their recreation program. And I oversee their before and after school program and we on campus for And we opened, we opened registration for our Sunday camp program on May 1st. We had a line of parents out the, out the door Within a matter of hours, every single spot for summer camp was filled for every single day. So we're looking at 65 to 70 children every day with as many parents that had their kids on a waiting list. My point is that I run a great program and the families know it. And why do I run a great program? Because I do something very simple. Remember, I'm working with kids. I have them complete a survey. The survey is very simple. The sad face is a happy face. For all of you,
you look out here and see the faces that you see, and you'll know the kind of job that you're doing and what you ought to do in response to that. Then you can have a great program as well. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, I will close the public hearing at this point. It's all the second. Yeah, I haven't said yes. Um, there have been a lot of accusations made against the district against us. But I believe that Lion High School is going to be our kids are learning great things. They have great teachers. And I it saddens me to hear that so many people think that our teachers and our staff are being disingenuous with our kids and teaching them inappropriate things because that's not the case. There's a lot of fantastic staff members and people who work every day to take care of the kids. And I love being a part of that. And I've had all four of my kids go through the Lion County School District, and I've been pleased with what has happened with them. And I really am telling you, we've heard a lot of accusations about CRT and all these different things being taught in our schools. They're not being taught in my entire school district. And if you find them, bring them, like you said, because my kids have gone through and I've had a positive experience. And I believe that our staff members are good, upstanding citizens who love the kids and who want to teach them good things. I fully believe that with all my heart. And this, I feel like through all the emails that I read, the underlying actual concern, probably to the one that you voiced tonight, but the other one is the underlying concern that there will be, and I quote, like wolf agenda or fear key or all these few things that are coming forward, and it's frightening. Well, I think that if you got to know me as a person individually, you would see that we would agree on a lot of things. Um, this is agenda item B D. Yes, and I'm making my comments regarding all the emails and everything that I've been getting up on this agenda item. Um, and so I just wanted to state that that um, all your comments regarding this issue and hiding things and and all these things that for me sitting here, I'm telling you that I'm sitting here and I can see what happens in our school district. And we have a great school district. Okay, just so you know, that's my comment. Thank you. I just like to say I hope our president would control the meeting and keep things on agenda. But um, I will speak to the agenda item. Uh, I think this is a bad policy. I, I, I will speak to the comments you made about Pastor Gary. Accusing you of being that's not on that's off topic as well. Oh, now you now you speak up. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Anybody else for for comment? Oh, just put on my desk. Uh um, I think we need to leave the way it was set for a bad. Well, we can, I would like to see it be on Zoom. I would like to open it up completely. Don't be afraid. Nothing bad is going to happen because these people get to see. Yeah. Nothing bad is going to happen because they get to watch it. <laughs> I think that the people have said, and you say you're supposed to represent them. I need to discussion. Fine.
I'd like to make a motion that we deny this proposal. Seconded. All right, there's been a motion to deny the second and final reading of the policy. Okay. No, deny, to deny what you're putting forward for changing public comment during our meetings. So the, the, I, meant, I meant that we do not change what we're doing during our, during our meetings. That's my motion. Okay. Second, Madam Parsons, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All those, all those opposed? Nay. 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 Are you listening? Oh. No, they're not. Oh. You're great. Oh. All right, I'm looking for an alternate motion at this point. Yes, I do. I move to approve policy as for a second and final reading. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Peterson, a second by Mr. Clark. Any further board discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, passes four, two, three. Thank you. We'll take a 10 minute break at this point. Three calls, three calls, three calls, three calls, three calls. Three calls. Three calls. Three calls. Three calls. Three calls. Three calls.
Now we're on item number 14, discussion of possible action regarding moving the July 2023 school board meeting from the district office to another location in the United States area. This item is being presented by myself and Superintendent Wayne Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. So, as stated in the board's memo, um, our district office is quite a small uh, location, and uh, to accommodate our public, we want to make sure that we have space available. So, that is the reason for this agenda and the solution. Thank you, Mr. Workman. So, one of my suggestions was to possibly move, I think, that we had some stuff going on in some of the Arrington schools. So, it seems like we would have an opportunity to move to Smith Valley. And we haven't been there in quite some time, so I'd like to look at that as a possibility of moving uh, that July meeting. Yeah. Pardon? Pardon? No, just, just for um, that's a good idea. I mean, we haven't been down there in a while. The other alternative uh, I wanted to ask about was your intermediate school because they have a large multi purpose room that we. You had a meeting there last November. You know, that's rather large. Yeah, I think that I mean just being there in November, I, I would like to see it personally. I mean, just because I I mean we haven't really represented the valley very much. I do have a comment about that. You know, it's I know before when we were talking about oh, should we continue with Smith Valley School because um uh you know it costs a lot of money per student when you only got a couple of hundred you got a not even a couple of hundred you only have a hundred children but we're just, just talking about but let's just sit in okay. go ahead but we decided that you know who wants those kids driving through that canyon and that's what I the problem I have with having read over them too much is that we're asking the public. I don't know unless you just don't want to see the public because the public's not going to go to Smith Valley. I mean, there will be a couple of diehards that will go, but in general, they're not going to go. Yeah, that's the way. That's part of your yeah. The whole reason that we moved to um, meetings around to all the different districts is to be sure, or the areas, is to be sure that the public has time to come out and come and talk. So Smith Valley doesn't have just as much uh, um, desire to have it in their school as well. That's not really fair to say. So I think that's a great idea. I mean, I can rent an intermediate and Smith Valley school to make sure the schedule doesn't speak to us about that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, these meetings they have to be held in a district office or a school or something like that, or is a community center uh, available to use? Um, yeah, I mean, the reason that we try basically the reason that we try not to hold them in the schools in the summer is because there's not staff in the building. Um, so that's why we, you know, typically, I mean, this meeting is held in the district office, but seating. Within the district office is fairly compact. Um, we can probably only get about 20 people in there. So I want to make sure that we accommodate those that want to come out um, to our meeting. And I think from this Hawaiian point, I mean, the people at the Valley have just as much of a right to hear our voice as the residents of the Arlington or Burnley or State University of Springs. And we just, I think it's been at least a before you, Mr. Cooley, but uh, firmly, their schools, they don't get visited every year. They do not because it's not the schools, it's the attendance area. Yeah, that's it's the area. area. But people go 
go to their school. They don't just go to an attendance area. In general, I think people, if there's going to be, they see the little sign there and they have a, something they want to say for their school, what's happening there, then they will go. And so it's important that every school is has an opportunity, every school. And, and it is true, Fernley has the most schools. Thank you. So just to, I think, clarify and answer uh, Mr. McIntyre's question, I think his question was, are we required to hold it in our schools or district facilities? And the answer is no, we're not required to do that. Obviously, we historically do because of their availability to us. Um, and then historically, we've held our June and July meetings outside of an actual school building. Uh, because we don't have the staff there to uh, help us set up and, and do everything. Obviously, tonight was an exception. We were anticipating a larger crowd, um, and we would not have fit into the PLC. And um, if that ends up being the case next month, uh, the boardroom at the district office would not be large enough to accommodate. So we could hold it at another location. We would have to obviously arrange that with um, whatever facility that is, the county or the city. Thank you. So, where, where exactly are we going to have it in a school or someplace rather than a school? I'm not I'm proposing to have it in a technology school. Yeah, as we can be hearing from the school. And I'm just concerned with both of those kinds of things. Are there any scheduling concerns and having to be able to make it? Uh, between Urington and Smith Valley, not necessarily. Uh, obviously, we've got some large projects going on in each of those schools. So, for example, if we were to go to Smith Valley, we would have to hold the meeting in their uh, auxiliary gymnasium, which has a brand new floor um, put in uh, this past summer because they're currently having work done in their main building and their main gymnasium with bleachers and such. A lot of the stuff is in their multi purpose room of the holding area or storage area. Um, that we, we would be able to find a place in Urington as well, either in one of the cafeterias there or, or, or something, but I have not cleared any, I have not checked on, on the Urington area yet. Any, I think I think it's done by motion. Okay. Um, so it looks like we're done with board discussion. Any uh, public discussion on this item? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion. I, I guess I'll make a motion that we have the meeting in Durington Intermediate School, multi purpose room at 215. Would you, would you consider adding to your motion? Um, depending upon availability, I think I could go with that. Availability. I'll take that. All right, uh, motion by Mr. Hendricks, second by Mr. McIntyre to hold it at Harrington Intermediate School if available, if not. We're going to give the superintendent, I guess, the discretion to find us a location within Urington or Smith. Can I amend my motion and say if that's not available, we move it to the alternative in Smith Valley or, or one of the other schools? I'll give one of the other schools school with an out of ten and area fine too. Okay, but so, is that a so, motion to amend. So that's a motion. Motion to amend that, that uh, initially we searched for other schools in the Asian area and leave the option open to move out to Smith Valley if needed. Okay. We've got a second to the amendment. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there's been a motion, an amended motion, and a second by Mr. McIntyre, and then a second. 
Any further uh, discussion on that motion? Seeing now all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, zero. Number 16, discussion and possible action regarding the line CSD bid number 2023 1. This item is being presented by the Executive Director of Operations, Harlan Baines, and Operations and Maintenance Supervisor at First McCall. For the Lion CSD, uh, for base Lion CSD 2021. Um, Lion CSD bid 2021 is very different than any bid. Um, we've all had this as well as presented bid in front of the board for specific projects. Um, this bid is not for specific projects. Um, this bid is similar to, um, for example, we've bought over the market partners and so as well. Um, it is a cooperative agreement that we've built together over the past, I say, six months. And present and published throughout the state of Nevada. Um, the goal um, with this is to provide buying power for not only agencies like my county school district, but for other school districts, other state entities, cities, municipalities, whoever is looking for the services that we put into the bid. So it's basically like going out and saying, we're not asking for prices just for Ryan County, we're asking for prices that anybody in the state can take that off of and contact us with. Them. So we put this bid out there, it was published all over the state, all the way down to Clark County and back up. And we received um, two bids and um, we can't we put a clause where we can accept both bids and have we're not presenting the option of both bids for you. It is, I, I can go on for, for quite a while I'm trying to explain what this is in much more detail, but I'll leave it open for questions before going down the rabbit hole. All right. Okay, uh, Ms. Parsons. Well, um, just to explain to us the difference between the two bids and the map. What are the differences? So the difference between the two bids um, is the, the, the pricing differences are pennies. We're talking, you know, uh, for a particular type of carpet or a particular type of pile, we're talking pennies. But uh, the main difference is contract services. Um, yeah, contract oriented interior services is a Northern Nevada company, and therefore they provide labor at a much cheaper rate than flooring stations on the map. But contract services, uh, contract flooring and interior services only bid on the carpet and um, interior finishing portion of the bid, whereas flooring solutions bid on the entire package, which includes exterior services as well, like after services. So, those are the two differences. And therefore, why we are uh, presenting the option to approve both. So, did you get a second bid for access services? And so, we'll know whether we need to take the lower bid plus the actual service bid or. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not finished. You said one bid was inside and outside. And then you but the other bid is just inside. So I'm saying the bid is the cheaper bid. Did you get another bid from the outside? Okay, so let me let me I, I might have done something that's explaining this. So we present we put we put out a three-part bid. The three-part bid um it included the first part was floor covers, which is basically in the off floors, class of floor type carpets. The second part was artificial turf and clay ball surfaces, basically our football fields, our playgrounds, anything. And the last piece of that was gym interior, basically our basketball courts, um, we have a room into a rubber court. So there's a three part bid. Each one of those parts has material and installation costs. The vendor or the contractor has the option to select any one of those parts there. We didn't care if you bid on one, two, three, or all three. Our goal was to get the best price for that product with the contractor understanding that whatever price you give, the entire state of Nevada has the option to piggyback on that price. So it was beneficial to the contractor to give the lowest possible price because they can go out and say, hey, you can hire me now. Well, 
Well, I can't. Or a city center. You can hire me now because my county put out a cooperative agreement that you can take that off. So we're we think that off of source, source wells, and all the apartments in the past, which is a national contract, which has national, um, I guess, overhead cost to it. And this is now us being the source of our own part. We're saying we're no longer going to be using that as their risk, which is significantly higher because they have significantly more overhead built in because um, they're a big company. Whereas we're my kind of food district. We don't have the overhead. Once we publish this out, and it's, a, it's approved by the board, anybody can take back off of it. And in addition to that, for example, say the city of Henderson or the city of Reno decided to take back off of this, whatever that contract is that awarded to either one of these two companies, we get a 2% administrative warrant back to this. So that's a million dollar project. We're getting 2% of that project back to the district for publishing it. Which in this message in the metal case goes directly to our capital. So it, it's different. In the past, we've done simply bleach our cost to 300,000, we got rebid, we're taking a lower slide. This is completely different. This has nothing to do with any project that we currently have within Lion County School District, but it has everything to do with future projects within Lion County School District. Because now we have pricing power to get cheaper flooring, um, cheaper output trucks to do. Like and but like bigger players. So that was a good one. Hopefully I'll explain it. <laughs> so the bid is for unit the bid is for unit pricing. Correct. So um if you if you go into the bid for both uh vendors, you'll see about I think about a dozen pages of pricing on each particular like this group costs you this much, this tile will cost you this much from this vendor and this vendor and this vendor. So this thing. It's in my my details. Uh, so a future project, we would say we just pick the line and this list that would complete that project. Correct. And we would already have the pricing, the correct pricing given here to determine the total cost of the project. Correct. And we were at no way um, held to it. So if, for example, we want to do carpeting, but our local carpenter in front of me is uh, giving us a better price. Correct, we'll take it off. Right. But at the end of the day, this is published out there. That local carpenter might not give carpet fitting at this price, so they can do market and then try to be in the construction price. So, so we get a two percent back in other districts that use this agreement. Correct. Well, I mean, that it has been like what Mr. Hank talked about the two percent back it's kind of almost like a finder fee if you think of it, right? It's a creator's fee for all the I got this. Okay. Flavor. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that that can add up. We're hoping so. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm grateful that we're being proactive now in doing that. And they do have incentive to provide lowest bid. So and I do appreciate that we're not held to that should you know something else that we want to do. So with that, thank you again. Any further uh, board discussion? And seeing that, I'll open it up for public comment. Anybody from the public wish to comment on the meeting this evening? I'll see anyone and close that one for a motion. President, I have make a motion to the board of trustees to approve the district recommendation to award both Lauren Blue of the bad FSI contract claim security service for line CSC bid number 2023 -1. Motion to approve this item by Mr. Farr, second by Mr. McIntyre. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes 7 to 0. All right, item number 16 discussion and possible action. Regarding CES and SSES dining hall roof, this item is being presented by Executive Director of Operations, Harvey Baines, and Operations and Maintenance Supervisor for the Council. Mr. President, Mr. Board, Prime Minister Houston, we're seeking approval for Sierra Coast roofing. Um, there was the re roof of uh, Cottonwood Elementary School and Silver Shades Middle School dining hall, or MCA, um, at a cost of $427,750. The bid as usual was published for NLS. 
and we received only one bid for this project. Um, fortunately, the bid price was within our budget, and this is what we are presenting for you today. Our goal is to have this project approved and uh, completed this project. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Parsons. Do you have any comments? Uh, any other board discussion? Uh, yes, I, I see we have a warranty, uh, five year laborers, workmanship warranty. Uh, do we have a start and completion date? Not yet, not until we have a project completed. Okay, any performance bonds? Um, you know, make sure I know we've had a problem in the past where we've lost contracts. Uh, that we were awarded, so I, I want to I protect ourselves. They, they put up a bid bond, correct? A bid bond. So, would that protect us from them backing out of this? If they back out, then we did bid bond. Okay, very good. Any other board discussion? All right, at this point, I'll ask for a public comment on this item if anybody has any. Any or motion? Okay. Yes. And the board has been approved the air code completion bid for four hundred twenty-seven thousand seven hundred sixty-two Beaver Cottonwood Elementary School and Middle Street Elementary School thing. Second. Beaver Cottonwood Elementary School. Second. 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 They not all of the in the public thing. I, 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 seven zero. Moving down to item number 17 discussion of possible action regarding an updated cost estimate for the CES and SES HVAC replacement. This item is being presented by Executive Director of Operations, Ron James, and Operations and Maintenance Supervisor, Kurt Paul. Mr. President, I'm supported by Ron Tennessee. We are asking for a budget increase for the um, uh, air handler unit operators for both Cotton Elementary School and Cooper Elementary School. Um, this board, in April 2020, um, board approved a estimated cost budget of $2.8 million. Um, unfortunately, as we progress to the final stages of that planning, um, several uh, unforeseen uh, project items have come up and therefore have increased the cost of the project. By four hundred and by approximately four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and just uh, three point two million dollars. Uh, we do have funds for this project within our bond capacity for future HVAC projects, um, and therefore we are seeking the approval for a budget upgrade to keep uh, this project going and in order to take equipment purchase as soon as possible in order to have it here next summer for potential projects. Any questions in my head? The parsons? Well, yes, I think in the time that it's come to life, like when you said the train doesn't stand by the stuff that are busy, you know, getting in the airplane. And now all of a sudden they want how much more? It's not for the equipment. It's for the labor. So, uh, but they want how much more? So, the entire project is going to be $460,000. $460,000 on a project that's going to cost about $1.5 million. Taken out of the attic and new air handlers, children, 
need to be wired and put in. So those are 40 plus years old. We're talking new electrical needs to be put in. We're talking new structural so the codes have changed over the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, not any company has the ability to take on such a project. These we're talking about a new wall in a school to get these things out. So it no, it is not. Be honest, I'm not trying as a company because I am unfamiliar with any of the companies that is capable of such. Well, I think you could just send it. sounds like a lot of it's going to go to electrical. So, aren't we just couldn't we just re electrify it, the school and try some of those other companies to now put in the smaller units and then the people can have the units in the classroom and adjust? I mean, that would be a lot more money. I was going to say, yeah, you talked about the requirements. Yeah, individual units for each one. Yeah. I understand they're not very expensive. That's what all the big buildings are going to do. Is, and they, people have control over the tension. With, with this, it's the one place to control everything, right? Well, your money hasn't shown the sense, right? It's pretty good. It's what we put in for the PCS with all the room control. It will start boilers, it will start therapy, it will maintain the work. This one was running until 10 o'clock, didn't run like your bed. It's late. So it's not like your home where you had a service that everybody can walk up and turn. We pre set them. So that all the classrooms are the same. I'd just like to make a quick comment that I think unfortunately we're paying a little bit for the sins of the past and the way that our buildings were built. Um, I know Sutro Elementary very well because my family donated the property that, that school sits on. I also worked for a construction company that did some of the construction on that school. And I know that very much um how corners were cut when building that school um the reason i mean why we would ever think of trying to cool a building of that size with swamp coolers is beyond me except maybe it was a little bit cheaper at the time and now we're paying for that now so it's unfortunate but that's kind of the way it goes and it does look like it's a pretty big scope of work as far as removing walls and having to cut the systems that are up there into pieces or you know basically just assembling them piece by piece to get them out so it is what it is. Yes, Mr. McIntyre. So this extra money uh, looks like it's coming out of a bond that we're taking from future projects. Is that what I'm seeing? Correct. So um, the board has set aside an additional million dollars for future aid that would like this project. So the four hundred and fifty thousand dollars will be coming out of that additional. Right. So do we have a plan to replenish that back, or I mean, of course, we're robbing from future projects to complete this one. But I understand, you know, something that has to be done to finish this one. But it, it, it's a it's a bond fund, so the only way to replenish that fund would be either through uh, investment earnings or through new bonds. New bonds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also draw in. Doing classroom visits and walk through the last year, the Cotton was one of the worst buildings. Um, so that we walked into some classrooms that were right next to each other, and one was pretty hot, and the other one was pretty cold. And there's no really rhyme or reason as far as why those different classrooms were different temperatures. So I think for the good of the students and the safety of our staff and everybody else, money well spent. Mr. Hendricks, so is will this fix that? This is something between the kind of control as well. So, sorry. Okay. Uh, another question Is this project related to any kind of project that we had bids for and then lost the contractor? No. no. Okay. Um, this question is uh, kind of ambiguous. I understand, but <clears throat> I, don't, I know we don't have a time frame because we have put this up here to prove the correct kids. So, but I'm looking at the DC versus flat earth for reroute of sidewalk and complete removal and replacement of store front the center in the top of the team that's very bad. So it's a pretty big seems to me like an invasive kind of thing to take place at that school. I'm assuming I'm not talking about any of the summer. Well, 
Yeah. Yeah. But so your Google Science would allow us to purchase equipment. Yeah. We, we are strategically the piece of equipment that this board couldn't change last year. Yeah. So the equipment for schools is a year out. So with your approval today, we're hoping that the supply chain will be taken to break and equipment is in here before the next summer. Um, at least in pieces to those who are in the process. And uh, and hopefully this is the next summer process. Thanks. So does this lock in the price? And then we approve this tonight and lock in the price. And this is not a price that based on receiving receiving the material, right? No, this this is an official quote to us, but we're not just you know make sure the land might be so there are uh working standards uh we have some public comment. Anybody have public comment on the fan? Yeah, so we'll try to move on to last time in April. Um, the strength of that activity at Clayton. I don't know. Um, I know there's a Lincoln meeting in AC in Reno, Park area. I don't know if they can take on a big tax like this, but they do do pretty close and they do have an eight plus on triple B rating, lifetime one season and everything. So I don't know if that's something to be looked into. We get a free quote to see if they can tackle a project this big and maybe we can get a better price than what train is offering. Any further public comment? Any none? One more. Yep. Second, please. Let me ask you something. If we approach Lincoln, Aaron, and you. I guess the question is, do we actually go out and actually physically go in, or do we just put them out the bid and people bid on it? They, they were certainly aware of the bid, right? So, Karen was speaking on the topic of where we just can't do it. We 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 can't do that approves the line out to that item as well. Um, we put it, it to set prices for um, they provide prices for all this equipment for public sector, um, the public sector entities, and um, that could be you're going to for about a year's time. So, they Lincoln wasn't allowed to bid on this. This isn't a project that's been going on today. This is the board approved train for this project. In, in April of 2023, the board approved the train for this project, and we are bringing forward the cost of this project now. Mm -hmm. Well, we can, uh, we don't have to be right. We can stay for a line pass, right? And, and go ahead and get a cut of here. I, I believe, I mean, we approved train in April to give us a hard bid on this project, and that's what these guys are presenting now. It's a hard bid because he's saying the price has gone up. So it could have been a hard bid. Mr. Chair? Yeah. If that were the process, it would have to be a motion for reconsideration of the whole action, which would have to be agreed by the team brought up to the proper procedure. I'm personally happy with, uh, I mean, obviously it's a, a national contract and we're getting good pricing on it. We also, I mean, we have those systems in our other schools and controls in our other schools. So, I mean, if we start changing up contractors now and different companies and everything else, I mean, that could be some issues down the road for us as far as, you know, servicing those units or making sure the building controls all work together and everything else. So. I, I just look at a, this is a national company, a very large company, certainly, uh, but they don't have a very good rating. And we have a local company that's capable of handling this project. 
seems like they would be a good alternative. I don't know why they weren't um, included in Omni's consideration to the project, but uh, I, so we took advantage of price point being yeah. through this Omni. Yeah. Right. Correct. Yeah, agreed to go with what their vendor were and agreed to go with the vendor train in this case. What their labor cost would be after the respective increase. I understand that's correct. Correct. Okay. So for us to not do that, for that to bid, I would like to know what their timeline would be. And you know, we have no idea on the cost because they haven't proposed to, to come back to it, right? I mean, I understand what you're saying, but we can't just go to a company, Mr. Andrews. We have to put up a business to bid on. Yeah, so they weren't even allowed to bid on. That's I understand that. I agree with you saying. Right. I think if we yeah. allow some companies to bid on this, would they be able to give it to us for this price? Yeah. Well, the other day that we wouldn't know until we ask that question. That's the thing. Yeah. That's the problem. All right. One of them. All right. So, well, I, so, I don't know. I know, you, Mr. Baines, you mentioned that it would take a year to get the equipment. So we're hinging right now on next June, if we're lucky, to be able to get the equipment and hopefully get that installed over the summer. I mean, if we drag this out another two or three months, and all of a sudden we're back into that August, September time frame. So we're going another whole school year of those classrooms having problems. That to me is somewhat unacceptable personally, but I, I agree that would be unacceptable to go months and months and months, but how about we approach some other contractors and see if they want to give us a bid and then reconsider this at the next meeting? I mean, I'm
Shopping centers in northern Nevada that have a tier view system. I mean, of this magnitude, we're talking about a huge school. Most, I mean, commercial centers, they all have individual units for the suites, whatever they have. So, I mean, we're talking to Apple and Orange at this point. I'm looking for a motion. Make a motion that uh, we approve. The uh, project budget increase for the Conway Elementary School and future elementary school air handling units uh, replacement from the two two million seven hundred sixty three thousand three hundred two to three million two hundred five hundred. Second. Thank you. I have a motion by Mr. Bowman. Second. Second. second by Mr. Farr. Any further board discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Discussion and possible action regarding critical labor shortage designation for the 2023 to the 2025 school years and by the machine presented by Executive Director of Human Resources, Don Hexi.
Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. All right, item number 19, discussion of possible action regarding the annual summative and evaluation of the Lane County Board of Superintendent and deciding to be presented by myself. Point I will send up for any discussion. I would just be um actually let me go one by one now. Ms. Parsons, would you like to go first? Sure. Um I just want to say I'm always based the evaluation, which from the time I've been on the board, it's absolutely good. And it goes down every year. But I based, I based the whole evaluation on test scores. The take the state test score. And um, this year we went down to the again. But I kind of feel like I have to justify it because if you look at that report, it looks pretty bad. But it's because when I come right before I come on, we were seventy-eight point two in English. Okay. Now for uh math, we were sixty-four point four. This year in math were fifteen point two. 15.2 when we used to be 64. And uh, the other reason it looks so bad this year was because I went over the results of absenteeism, and it was one of the women uh, from the audience who asked me, here, but she asked me, um, what is the, the absenteeism for those that go to, uh, because she didn't like what she seen and she saw the birth of the dad. So she said, but how many people are going to do online? And so I think every month we should have, since the state says that we have gone to get double the black here yeah, our FCC double. We have gone from 18.3 to, I better do that. 18, 18.5, it's not like the name we're getting in, to 39.2. Okay, and then the third reason that I done this is because of the amount of money that they can get per child. And you know, I never said anything for years. I go, I don't want to be paid, you know, but it didn't pass the joke. It's a couple of thousand dollars if for kids, it's two thousand dollars each. For a lot of these years, we just got to start equaling it out a little bit. But it was really mainly the absenteeism. And, and it, you know, I was wondering when we were doing the buses, we changing the buses. Is the areas that would be trying to get parents mad so that they wouldn't be sending the kids? Well, it worked. Can I say that Mr. Bain to come up and explain how uh, schools are funded, please? I mean, I could do it, but I'd rather have you do it. Probably the same when I worked as the financial officer for the district. That's correct. We are not funded um, by the state. Um, we are funded based on people by the state of Nevada. So yeah. whether they all live in Dave or whether they all live in Carmody, it's not going to matter. We're going to get the same amount of funding per kid. So it's not, there's no way to say um, 
in that early view, what people are saying. There's no way to say that there's only one way to debate because everything's done on a per people basis. And basically, I mean, you guys built the budgets of the district office it's based on high school student gets X amount, middle school student gets X amount, elementary school student gets X amount. That is correct. And there's no like state and high school student gets X amount, and Bernie high school student gets X amount of the same, correct? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's still the same as when I did it. Right. Right. But I just wanted to make sure because I wanted to spell that in work. The state shows what each area gets. If you look it up, I mean, sure. I mean, I'm funding it. That's, oh, funding the state. that's what I'm saying. That means the firmly should be getting almost half, but we're not. But that's okay. That's okay. But at least we want to get the same service. I didn't think that's my fair statement that there's a lot of things going to that state number or federal well, grant. Let's go look at the state numbers. The new I, state puts it out, just like it puts out the absentee numbers, just like they put out the uh, the numbers for the math test. Just go look. I looked at those reports when I was with the district. I know exactly what you're talking about. There's a lot of different funding sources that go into that. It's not district funds and grant is based on. Uh, free and reduced lunch eligibility. I mean, there's a lot of different factors that work into how much money goes to each area. It's not fair to say somehow the district's sliding firmly no. for the benefit of Dayton. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe it's maybe it's because it's a little smaller school. But then we went to Yurkton, and they get a you know, and they're smaller even still, and they get less too. So, uh. I think it needs to be even out a little more. Okay. Sorry for you on the spot. But... All right. Are you done with the parties? Yeah. All right, perfect. Mr. Hendrick. I just uh, was looking at some of our own documentation here on the where district stands in relationship to the state, keeping in mind the state is the 47th, ranked 47th in the nation. Uh, and all of our standards are falling below what the state um, standard is. Actually, we're in the bottom 50% of the districts in our state. I went to the Nevada Department of Education website and looked up where we were. 15% um, in math, and I basically found the same information that Sherry did. Um, so what it, what it equates to is a 54% decrease since 2016 in our English scores and a 77% Decrease in our math scores. So I, I just looked terrible to me. And I wish we could do better. Um, well, I, I, I think that's just a graph. No, I think they're a graph. Yeah. So we decreased 77% since we've been on board to math. And, and I realize, you know, we have better graduation rates than we had previous years, but when you look at the state report on that, it shows that um, college readiness has gone down. And that's because of students are not taking the core subjects to get them ready for college. Uh, again, um, that's... Or they're just not testing well. well According to the state, they're not taking the core, but it's core curriculum. So, yet we're still asking students what they want to learn. And obviously, they're not making their best choices because they're not ready to go to college or actually move out in the real world. So, I think, um, and I'm speaking specifically to Portrait of a Learner, which is a program that we have here in the county. Um, that initiates that type of thought where we, we want to ask the students what they want to learn. And 
in doing so, uh, they're making their own choices. So I, I, as I voiced in the past, I'm not in agreement with that program. Thank you. So just a quick comment. So I mean, you're basically in the spot and test scores and different things, but I mean, those metrics are constantly changing. So when you're trying to compare test scores, test scores from 10 years ago to today, they're just not the same metrics. They, they, one year, one year. They change all the time. They change all the time. I can give you the data that came out of our last report that, um, from the September 27, 2022, item number 16, which shows our declines. It's from our own report here. Um, my evaluation was, as I stated in some of my comments, you know, we get on the board for two months. Uh, really hard to give him a, a, a true evaluation of where I think he's at. Um, I did get to meet with him for the last year and a half to attend the board meeting. But that's why I gave him an evaluation. Uh, I'm in a similar situation with the max therapy, being very new on the board. But I did have the honor to work with Mr. Workman um, as well with an educator in the classroom, coming on the board, knowing what I was going to be dealing with, and having a lot of questions. He was very patient, very thorough, explaining the data to me, explaining the curriculum to me, going over a lot of the information that I wouldn't be privy to, uh, not having been on the board yet. And so I based my right. Yeah, I uh, want to thank Mr. Orson for being a fantastic superintendent. Um, I have been around for a while and I have seen other superintendents around the state, and I know that um, they respect uh, Mr. Wilson and his work that he does, and he is um, thought highly by his colleagues. And I want to thank him for. Um, being a fantastic leader, um, he that's a great employee uh, for working with us, for working with your team on the cabin. Um, I appreciate all of your long hours and all the time that you put in to taking care of the the So thank you. Mr. Peterson, fine. Um, I agree. I just wanted to kind of feed back on the what Mr. Peterson said. Um, you have super an amazing award, uh, not easily won. I mean, we definitely have a wonderful superintendent. Um, I've worked with you for many years now, and um, you need to know what the time you have here. Um, I don't like seeing all the ladies in the basket with um, test scores. I have an autistic child, and I'm the first one to tell you test scores don't believe the real whole picture. Um, so I think that overall, we need to look at the peer picture and get clear, concise leadership. Um, and in comparison with some of the other students, I think we're lucky. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
I can see where all of our test scores um, would be suffering a little bit. So, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, my, yeah, I've never seen the graduation rate being lower than anything in the state. So, and again, you know, I'm a firm believer in that not every kid needs to go to college. So, um, we have some great PPE programs, and a lot of kids want to follow that path in life. And right now, to be perfectly honest with you, I think they're a lot smarter off than the ones going to college because there's amazing opportunities out there. Um, with you know, some of my work that I do at Northern Nevada Development Authority, you know, recruiting new companies in the area. I mean, there's such a need for a talented workforce, and I think that we're building some great learners. Um, out of Lyon County School District. I'm proud of the schools that we have, the teachers that we have, and I mean, the leadership that we have. And so, you know, I think my score has reflected that pretty well for Mr. Workman. And we, it's, uh, you know, the set of the board, I'll say it again, I think we have the best superintendent in the state of Nevada. So that's where I might comment. Any public comment? students here should have. 
I heard it from college. When I was in the military and I was taking classes myself, they used to get degrees. That's bad attitude that students are having. Our job is to prepare them for the world, the real world. And it's mean out there. And if we just blow them through and let them graduate with whatever, they're going to get their butts handed to them out there. Where do we have to prepare them? This is not preparing them. 43rd or 47th out of 50? Jeez, I would be embarrassed to call that, especially if I was someone like the superintendent. These numbers have got to come up. It's a 47% rating is uh, across the United States, and it has to do with funding for people. That's the state that is in the first place to do. So, yes, they are funded at 47%. Um, I I'm also not a fan of test scores. I know a lot of things can affect attendance, including the weather in Texas past year. But as a newcomer to this town, I can tell you what you guys may be not considering is the opinion of the parents and the students. Uh, I might suggest to you that you take a survey. And I'm sorry, sir, I'm not familiar with you either. Um, so I'm not directly speaking to you. But, but uh, when we moved to this town, the first thing I heard is the school but terrible. Fortunately, I don't have students anymore in the school. Uh, another metric you can look at is how many students that could be going to Lyon County School choose the different options homeschooling, charter schools, private schools, um, rather than go to these schools because they're so terrible. And so, if you guys don't agree with test scores, you don't agree with attendance, you're arguing about you know, who gets the raise and who doesn't. Um, I'd like you to consider another piece of the, the picture is what the community thinks. And you saw over 100 people here tonight showing you what they think about the school. And I think that problem goes together that you're not listening to the parents or the community. Um, and therefore, your school better be fine. Um, a lot of people have a lot of wealth of knowledge and input that could be useful. You know, great lines working together can do great things. Um, if you're shutting people out and just patting each other on the back, which is what I'm doing during my, oh, we have wonderful schools, we have wonderful teachers, we have wonderful teacher attendance, you're aligning yourself to the reality that uh, unfortunately, my county schools are not what you think they are. So I encourage you to open your eyes and I dare you, I challenge you, take a survey of the parents and the community and see what people are really think. And that's, you know, that's how businesses work. People pay with their dollars. People pay, you know, people vote with their feet. And people vote in elections. So I encourage you guys to listen to the community and see what they think and count that as a message. Thank you. I think you uh, read my mind that had actually um, that's the work I believe it's going to be put together here pretty quick. So we're going to get a parent uh, satisfaction survey of all the parents because I really do want to know what the parents think. I, I think you made no one point there. I don't think our schools are terrible. I think we have some of I mean, we have great teachers. You know, I've had five kids in Lyon County School District. Uh, they've all made their education what they want to make their education. So, um, you know, each individualized. I mean, to try to say that, you know, all of our schools are terrible and everything else. I mean, there's a lot of that falls somewhat back on the parents, too, and how involved the parents are. So, good evening. I'm Deputy Michael Cullen, your day at the room. Don't care about numbers and stuff. I just want to speak to it is the teacher's responsibility to get the kids ready, it's the parents' responsibility as well. I deal with kids at all five levels, K through 12. You would be astonished how much parents disconnect from those who are actually in school. Um, when it comes to education, grades, disciplinary factors, I deal with it all. I'm a mentor, uh, law enforcement personnel, buddy coach, you name it. Um, parents are blind. I'll tell you, 80% of the kids go to school, they try to learn as 
because they're you have to get a facility because they don't do very well in school. Sports have bigger room than they need. Parents are blind, don't really have any room school. Their kids are the ones that are out there like no, they're out there baby or just class, but they're the first ones that complain when their kid has a year and a half or is not going to graduate. I deal with these kids on a daily basis. I come out to help so spring quite often as well. So I'll be out at number 10 schools. Um, and it's a vast majority of the kids that are that way the parents are blind, they don't know what's going on. So it's not fair the reflection that it's all the work fault. The schools that I operate in, the teachers are the best. We are short on teachers. They don't have the time to force the kid to learn. They'll give them every opportunity. That kid doesn't want it, they're gonna go, okay, cool, we'll try to get you something else. Uh, but it's not fair to put all the onus on one person at the very top when raising kids is a multi pronged thing. Community raises the kids, school raises the kids, parents raise the kids. So who's that keep that in mind? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I hear amazing, amazing stories from our teachers and what they do to get kids to school. Um, I know, you know, there's some teachers at state elementary school that on occasion will go out and pick up a student and bring them to school. And that's not in the, their job description necessarily, but at the same time, it's like the teacher cares so much for that kid that they want to get into school and they'll do whatever they can to do it. I appreciate that SRO comments and I've been in that state and high school office a few times when you're in there, uh, having a little tough love with you know when you want the students and you know trying to trying to help them see that maybe the choices they're making is not going to be down very good path. So I, I appreciate and I especially appreciate you being here. Well, so, Neil McIntyre for the record. Um, you know I said. Um, where you guys are sitting right now for 14 years and in then 14 years I went uh this school district went through uh portions of tenants and I'll tell you that. and I will say hands down that this school and things by far the best superintendent in the state of Nevada. Uh, it, it's well represented by by the comment that his peers have made um, towards it, as well as myself working with Mr. Workman. Uh, he has great morals. He loves kids. He has a lot of kids. I have five kids, 25 grandkids, and four great grandkids, and none of them come in all, all of them have been to find chemistry. And so, you know, I heard a comment tonight um, when Jim earlier in the meeting was discussing how his kid can't write or read. Um, another one just spoke on his kid saying he got a D, but it was passing. You know, what point are the parents going to take responsibility that it's not just the eight hours or seven hours that they're in school that the teacher teaches them that they learn? At what point do the parents take control and connect with their children and make sure they're doing what the teachers are teaching them while they're in class? I know with all my kids, when they, when they come home from school, that their mother and I made sure they did their homework. We read to them, we had them read to us to make sure they could read right. We looked at their home, we watched their homework, we made sure they turned in our homework. At some point, the parents have got to start taking responsibility for their children as well. It's not all, all the teachers' responsibility to teach the children. Uh, children can learn so much more at home from their parents uh, than, than I've seen in recent years. Um, as far as uh, I think um, my son made a comment on he hadn't been on the school board that long to really uh, give uh, Mr. Workman a really true uh, evaluation, although he's been coming to the meeting since uh, he's been trying to get on the school board. Um, and so it's really hard, uh, I believe. Um, Mr. Farr also made a comment that he hadn't been on the board. Uh, long enough to really give him a real defined um, evaluation. So 
uh, Miss Parsons has been, or Mr. Hendricks has not been. And uh, I don't know if your evaluations are the same as when I was on the board, but if they are, you can give a person an evaluation on a test for so long. Uh, there are so many different um, uh, things that you evaluate the superintendent on, and test scores are not the only thing. I'm not saying they were part of it, but I'm saying it should not be the only thing that you uh, would evaluate the tour or not. Uh, Ms. Workman, I appreciate everything you've done for the school district. Uh, and just a little known fact. Years ago, uh, superintendent's um, longevity used to be between three and five years uh, anymore. It, um, they say it's a year to a year and a half to the school. Uh, district has a superintendent, Mr. Workman, I believe, has been here eight years. And, and you've done a fantastic job as far as I'm concerned. I've had a lot of kids and grandkids go through the school district that have done it very well. And I think it's because the parents are involved with their children, not just the school. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. McIntyre, Mr. Stone. Anybody else? Oh, did you need to, you need to approve the ring. Okay. I have it. Oh, okay. I, oh, okay. I'll in response to Ms. Manning, I did look at the number of things besides test scores. So, where we are with those, uh, some of those in disrepair and teacher retention is another one. You know, we have a very have a great problem in maintaining teachers. Um, I looked at last week, I was. So I haven't seen if we've hired seven new teachers, but then I went further, we lost 14 more. So, and so we're waiting until the 30th of this month to see how many more are gonna exit our district. But I do believe community involvement is a critical part of the learning process. And I don't think we have enough of that here in Lyon County. We do. Ranked 47th in the nation in test scores. That number is not related to funding. We are below the national average. Uh, but take, for instance, Utah. They have the lowest funding in the nation, yet their test scores are in the top 20. So, what else does Utah have that we don't necessarily have in the community involvement? Brown involvement, probably. I mean, yeah. And that's a heavy emphasis on education. Yeah. yeah. So, I just, um, I feel we could do better at it. Money helps, but it's not going to solve all the problems. Uh, and we now we have a great deal of money. So hopefully we can do better. Um, could we, uh, I just wanted to say that on those, those evaluations, we used to have a number beside us, like one through five, and then Miss Valine, when she was the board president, she didn't take the average. She started just going by the mode. And I think we need to go back and average them out, especially now there's two of us, because like your, you put it in me, but with his and mine, like I'm learning, if you would do those number wise, give them a number like one through five, and then you average them and you take his average and mine. Now it's starting to make a difference because instead of him getting an E in learning, he would have got a good. So so don't do it by mode anymore. Go back to the way it used to be. And I never said anything because I thought, well, it was just me, so it didn't make any difference. But now there's two of us, so it will make a difference. So don't do just the most. Do an average. So when you say there's two of you, what do you mean? Well, because uh, before. It was 47, so it's kind of But they used to be 
of them would say, oh, all excellent and outstanding. And I was the only one that, so it really didn't, I didn't think I was going to argue over it. But now there's two of them, so start number and begin one to five, and give the average, and you put dash excellent when it should be good. Well, why aren't we doing an average? What they were doing is just no, why aren't we doing that now? Well, I think it should be, but it's not. No, it's too that they were thinking in the boat. Like if there's the most key, then they would get it. Hey, the person. Why? It's a yes. it's a numerical uh, rubric if you would like yes. uh, that can be tested with. Is it is it an average? Well then how can I no, it's not an average three okay. for learning if it was three point three that would be good. Which he, which he's stating is correct. It's not an average. It's something it's other than that. It is small, yes. Yeah, I think it should be an average. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, Second. Second. Peter said, and a second by Mr. Farr to the ratings. Any further discussion? Not all of the fairs in the part by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, and number 20 discussion of possible action regarding new LTSD policy based on new management of opioid related drug overdose administration of opioid and agonist as the second and final reading. The title is being presented by Chief Nurse Kelly Becker. Good evening, Kelly Becker here. Uh, so, as mentioned last month, I'm just making the board policy JCP. It does lay out the position, training, administration, reporting, and learning and teaching culture. Thank you, Dr. Kane, from the first reading of policy, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you. Any board discussion? I just want to do more to you. All right. Let me talk to the people. Let me go. For the board discussion, public comment. Yes, Devin Cullo, Lawn County Sheriff's Office, Dayton, FRO. Uh, this needs to be put in place six years ago. Like, it's not a joke, but I run five schools in Dayton. Um, I work 12 schools, a lot of nurses in Dayton School, 12 over spring. Opioids are scary in here. I don't care if anybody wants to say drugs are from. Um, and the issue I have is that in our current capacity, I'll be one, I'll be one in my area out to the school unit that carries Narcan. Um, first responders, as far as the paramedics, all carry that, but our drug overdoses are usually happening in middle school high schools. Okay. If I'm in Riverview Elementary, I have a bunch of kids and I have an opioid overdose at high school with no Narcan, that's an eight minute drive. I'm going to three to 100 miles an hour uh, to get there. That's too long. The kids are probably going to pass out, pass away. Um, so, giving the ability to have our nurses. Um, on site, have access to Narcan is huge. I mean, the three minute window is usually the cutoff line where if they're up to they're probably not going to make it without that dark Narcan. Um, and the training is fairly simple. The training that we go through the online video uh, it tells you what Narcan is, when you use it, what to look for, what to to look for if you want to read this for a second dose. Uh, something that can easily be done by all of our medical staff at the school. So I highly, highly, highly recommend that we have uh, carry Narcan because. You don't want to know what kind of thing. A kid did get into fentanyl and they're overdosing and they call paramedics. Whatever it was in the our paramedic station, the folks wanted to be uh, right there on the riverboat. So they also have a six to eight minute drive to the high school, middle school, depending on traffic, and it's too late. So you need to have that on site. All schools, because school kids can bring something from mom and dad's house too. So every nurse, nurse station, and probably somewhere in the main office should have access to my kids. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for those comments. Yeah, no, that's definitely. All right. I mean, I definitely want to, you know, keep it on topic, but this is something that, you know, I dealt with a lot in a former job when I was 
And um, what USDA rolled the bell, and then we actually what was held the rural opioid summit uh, with the undersecretary down in Las Vegas. And I mean, the story that you hear is tragic. And I mean, having Narcan there is one one additional tool in the toolbox to help somebody that's overdosing. And it's, I think it's long overdue, like you were saying, it's something we should have done six years ago. So appreciate that. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those. Oh, wait, I guess there's motion going. I can move on. Oh, Ms. Parsons. I just like to make a recommendation that the board approve um, the new policy with the opioid regulation and administration of opioid antagonist as a second requirement. Ms. Parsons and second by Ms. Peters. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? zero. All right. Number 21 discussion of possible action on agenda items of future board meetings and or information item requests, including a summary by the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. President. So for the board meeting in July, we have uh, a few items. Uh, number one, we hope to have an update uh, on the Wisdom Park bill. Uh, something that's been uh, kind of selling out the city a bit. And so uh, our team is on top of that and, and requesting uh, information on that. Uh, we'll also have an item on what are called Falcon restrooms to put around the school. Uh, we know there's a concern with uh, not having restrooms available at, at uh, some of our uh, athletic fields in the district. And then uh, I mentioned this to you before, but uh, we will uh, have uh, uh, the, the People Center Funding Plan has a special fund section for English learners at risk and uh, gifted and talented students. And uh, we want to bring our plan forward uh, for the board to consider. And as of right now, that's everything I have for that meeting. All right, thank you. Any other items? Good. Public participation. Public participation is there. Let's come up. Those sort of one final thing. Keep hearing a lot of comment on public participation, parent participation, whatnot. I made a comment about one student I heard, and I made sure he got those grades up along with his mother. So we were involved in that as many parents are when we find out. Public participation you want it, you gotta quit voting against us. That's how it can be now because you voted against what the public wants. You get more public uh, participation, more parent participation when you start speaking to the public and for the parents, not against them. Yeah. I'm Maria, sorry, I'm PDA. Um, I just wanted to know how soon we can expect to find out where the providing is going to be and where we'll be posted. So that way I have, you know, everyone has plenty of advanced notice to be able to prepare if it's going to be quite a bit of a drive. Just want to plan ahead. Thank you for further discussion. Okay. 